we are we are live on uh, youtube as well now waiting for 10 o'clock 11 11 no sir okay okay sir you can uh, screen your screen by yourself sir yeah 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 i'll do okay. that okay I, i also have it ready in case if you want i can do it yeah you can start the we just after uh, reena uh, gives you know, it you are you are ppt sir Yeah, my PPT. I will share it myself. Oh, okay, okay, fine, sir. Because I, I, I can move it. No? Okay. I'll stop with my last three case presentation. Once you're done your case presentation, then I'll do the cases. Sir. The credentials and then uh, secondary condition. Yeah. Okay. Basic will complete. But case yeah. reports you start first. Then I'll add on the uh, three small cases alone. Okay. 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 I have okay. few few basic slides also. Yeah, that you can. Start. When do you want to do that, sir? Initially or? Uh... No, no. After you finish, before you okay. start the cases, before you okay. start the cases. Okay. Okay. So what I can do is maybe uh, share my do that small uh, couple of slides, then okay. do the cases, okay. and then I will finish my cases. Then you can show your cases. Fine. Because yours, uh, yours are like uh, more than. Like, Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, ma'am, you can start. Uh, it's eleven. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, a very good morning to one and all from the Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons of Tamil Nadu Pondicherry Chapter. The month of June has been uh, marked out for the trauma webinar series. One among the webinar series that are to follow in the months to come every sunday at 11 o'clock we would be having webinar series on different aspects of maxillofacial trauma this week we have speakers and moderators taking care of the webinar series on mid face fractures of the middle third fractures this is an initiative by the association of oral and maxillofacial surgeons tamil nadu and pondicherry chapter along with the craniofacial academy of striker over to you dr jimson to uh, introduce the speakers of today's webinar thank you thank you, uh, thank you ma'am for the introduction uh, now we have uh, the panelists uh, Uh, for this session uh, we have dr krishna kumar raja uh, who does not require an introduction he uh, graduated from annamalai university way back in the year 1985 and then went on to do his masters in uh, oral maxillofacial surgery at uh, davangri uh, and then uh, he had a brief stint at uh, uh, uk uh, for a couple of years as a, a registrar and then came back to india then he started a teaching career at uh, ragal dental college uh, followed by balaji dental college and now uh, he is the professor and head of the departments uh, at srm dental college ramap and i am also proud to say that i am uh, his uh, student as well so welcome sir to this uh, program thank you jameson thank you thank you jameson next uh, i have uh, dr arun who did his uh, bds uh, from pondicherry uh, and then the mds in uh, the gondrendal college chennai and right now uh, he is the associate professor at uh, the gondrendal college chennai and he is doing lot of uh, trauma work uh, in his institution welcome dr arun to the show thank you jim and uh, next uh, we have dr emmanuel and dr the next dr emmanuel uh did his ug from tavita dental college and mds from uh, ragal dental college and right now he is working as the uh, uh, associate professor at uh, sri ramachandra dental college welcome uh, dr emmanuel and uh, dinesh uh, 
he did his ug and pg from ragas general college and right now he is head uh, the director of uh, pg at uh, ragas general college welcome back to the next and uh, now over to emmanuel and the next to moderate the session thank you so good morning everyone it is a very interesting topic mid phase fractures especially when it involves a uh, lot of uh, components in fact if you look at mid phase fractures it, it is a very broad thing and i think we'll restrict to a smaller area because the often neglected area will be the nasoethmoidal uh, fractures etc and we have very experienced hands speaking on it so i think we can go to the program uh, emmanuel wants to speak over to kk rajgarh sir for his presentation so uh, uh, let me first uh, start by thanking uh, uh, dr jimson dr reena and of course our association and uh, the striker company for uh, giving us this opportunity i think uh, this this kind of uh, you know uh, the advantages of such webinar thanks to covid as students uh, from any part of the world can benefit uh, from lectures and uh, we've been having such excellent lectures thanks to the initiative by uh, i think jimson and uh, the trainer and uh, so fortunately for all the students they can really benefit and uh, today uh, uh, jimson asked us to uh, talk on management of mid phase fractures but mid phase uh, you know involves the zygoma the maxilla the nasal bone the uh, nasal cord complex the orbit so this is such a vast topic we decided just to uh, stick to management of mid phase of the zygoma the maxilla so we will start with uh, uh, dr arun will uh, start with this lecture on the basics of uh, mid phase fracture and then we will discuss some cases then we have some more cases uh, from me uh, on uh, management of zygoma maxilla and to an extent nasal cord so i request of arun to start uh, the first presentation thank you sir yeah good morning one and all uh i'd like to thank uh, our president professor reena john and our dynamic secretary wherever he is dr jimset and uh, Special thanks for my co-host and co-speaker, Dr. K K R, who is such an eminent and senior person. I am actually honored to be in his presence, and I have some personal uh, connection with the master. He is our uh, batch muffler, so uh, <laughs> his wife happened to be my classmate. So I have a special connection. Such a humble human being he is. So this webinar pandemic has become more than the Corona COVID pandemic. but at least this has been like a constructive one so let's not um, uh, cringe about it so happy to be in the webinar we'll straight away go into the topic yeah yeah a middle part of everything uh, is also is always the troublesome because a uh, life or uh, middle part of a wife or uh, even the face at least we will deal with the uh, face alone today facial injuries can be uh, very um, uh, what do you say it's complicated you never know what happens which is serious injury among all these things so it's a kind of tricky one unless you give a thorough examination you never know which is the trickiest one right again etiology among all now the domestic violence has become uh, the most prominent etiology in the covid time it's again increasing right and trauma is always about a team you are not uh, a single man player or a single man army you always be a part of the team and we as a maxillofacial surgeon are a definitive part of a maxillofacial i mean trauma team we cannot be omitted at any cost we are to be there right from the beginning 
it depends on cases and depends on situation where we can pitch it either as an opening batsman or an all rounder or at the tail end whatever it is we cannot be just ignored and as a trauma team general trauma team we are always part of the team and if it comes to facial trauma we have to be the boss of the team most likely so most of the traumas come like this pan facial and you don't know where to start and who will start so always it's about primary care when the patient presents to you the first thing is about is like abc abc protocol should be followed by the uh, general physician or the neuro team or whatever it is leave way for them once they are in control then the oral maxillofacial surgeon pitch in right from examination this is the most important part of any uh, maxillofacial trauma always extra oral palpation first inspect look for signs and then extra oral palpation this comes uh, foremost and this you cannot miss this this just cannot read the ct straight away or uh, just diagnose with the x rays and other things always do a manual examination of the cases before even you look into a ct or any investigation starts or even the case sheets just go and examine the patient as a whole right so check uh, just follow an order right it be like a supraorbital rims right stand from behind palpate all the supraorbital rims and then the infraorbital rims look for eye signs and then hold the nose use your bimanual palpation technique like this shown in the picture and particularly maxilla mid face you have to bimanually examining for the abnormal movement hold near the nose part and then check for the movement holding the dental arches both digitally and also bimanually across the palate move each and every part individually and then you have to make a diagnosis you can clearly see the movements and you can see the movement you can feel the movement if there is a uh, sort of lipo to at the nasal junction or you will feel alone in the lower part of region so just palpate with both the hands and then you can make a diagnosis like this and always look for an occlusion class 1 class 2 and class 3 how it goes right after getting an uh, initial diagnosis with your examination then go for imaging imaging always starts with an x-ray and most often mid face x-rays are going to become a bit obvious right now so x rays always give you a single dimension except for a pns and a classical submento vertex view where it shows the zygomatic arch fracture uh, there is not major role for an x ray to play here uh, at least for the mandible you have an opg for a mid face uh, most likely 3d ct and a reconstructed ct and the sectional ct are always a mandatory one now it has become a mandatory one you cannot replace uh, without a ct because it gives you a clear idea of what you are going to deal with and how you are going to deal with even for treatment planning gives you a three dimensional picture and always an additional advantage anybody can read this so you can explain the patient as well where it all is fractured and how severe it is by doing your know, 3d pictures and now the latest thing is about three dimensional models you can make a stereo lithographic models with the three kind of 3d cts so that it's even more better you have a fractured skull right in your hand it's worth for a treatment planning or as for a uh, um uh, reconstruction any part you can do whatever you want you can play with your stereo lithography model and you can even print something uh, as a um, graph material or whatever it is right so this is the latest advancement always follow the scamps and transplants line uh, even from the start of the examinations also for the ct first line crosses the zygomatic frontal the superior margin of the orbit and the frontal sinus second line across the zygomatic arch infraorbital rim and the nasal bone and the third line right across the condyle coronoid process and the maxillary sinus and the fourth line that that goes parallel to the occlusal plane along the mandibular ramus and the fifth line the lower border of the mandible if you keep uh, devotionally following these five lines you won't miss any findings just uh, both in the manual palpation as well as your ct just follow these lines and you won't miss out any fracture if you follow this in order and what are the goals of fixation always it's about reduction of the bone fragments anatomic reductions and you have to get a functional stable fixation of the fragments and a traumatic technique approaches and other things is not injure uh, other nerves and blood vessels while uh, reducing the fracture or fixing the fragments so that you have to keep in mind and so obvious the results early active pain free mobilization of the jaws and any normal function that is a goal of fixation so what is mid face mid face is the area between the superior plane drawn through the zygomatic frontal sutures tangential to the base of the skull that is the upper line and almost on the lip out one level right inferior plane at the level of the maxillary dental occlusal surface so this is the part we are going to deal with the mid face this is called as a mid face 
it has the nasal bones the zygoma and the maxilla bone and the nasal bones that is how orbit occurs these are the thing we are going to deal today and at a profile view they are not parallel the upper line and the lower line is not parallel it's almost converging posteriorly towards the foramen magnum that is how it goes your maxilla and our mid face bones goes this way this is like a pyramid almost this helps the reason whenever the maxilla gets fractured it goes downwards and posterior that is how it moves that is this is the reason behind this because this is a solid bone so your maxilla goes like this in a slope that is why you get an anterior open bite and mechanism of midface fracture uh midface is like a pillars it's not a solid bone it's like a pillars of it's like a eiffel tower or a telecom tower it's with pillars horizontal pillars and horizontal bars and vertical bars it's made up of bars which is filled in between thin bones and it is surrounded by a lot of cavities i mean amidst it includes a lot of cavities that is your sinus cavities orbit cavities and uh, rest the things so it, it's basically a thin bones which is uh, fabricated in a horizontal and vertical pillars the areas of strength of this mid face mainly relies on the horizontal pillars and the vertical pillars and also the muscle attachment so the areas of weakness being the suture lines and the lining tissue and the apical cavities that is the sinus cavities what are the vertical buttress these are all the three vertical buttresses on which it stands naso maxillary buttress runs along the piriform rim and this region and the second one is the zygomatic or maxillary buttress the third one being the pterygomandrily buttress this is the vertical buttresses and the horizontal buttresses is the frontal bar that is the supraorbital rims the infraorbital rim along with the zygomatic arch and the last one is the maxillary palate so these are all the horizontal buttresses even when treatment planning these are the areas we uh, go about fixing because that is the possible region that you can fix other bones are quite thin and fragile even if you don't fix it that doesn't matter So again, mid-face fractures are classified like this, which affects occlusion and which doesn't have any effect on occlusion. Maxilla fractures invariably have an effect of occlusion, whereas orbit, nasal bone, zygoma, frontal, and the combination fractures with a NOE may or may not have an effect on the occlusion. But if it involves the maxilla, it definitely have an effect on the occlusion. Again, maxilla fracture, the classical Brené report, the French anatomist who discovered, uh, I mean, who made an experimental study found out this classification of blood clot 1 2 and 3 that is the classical urin fracture pyramidal fracture and the craniofacial disjunction which is later classified uh, modified by marciani right he classified again subdivided blood clot 1 2 and 3 and also included a blood clot 4 the clot one with multiple segments and two a and b with nasal and ethmoid fractures and the clot 3 again with nasal and ethmoid fractures classified with a and b sub classification and four With the supraorbital rim and the anterior cranial base, so that is how we have modified this lapel fractures. Of course, but what we practically see doesn't uh, exactly fit into all classifications because mid face is totally we get all shapes and sizes which may not fit more often into these classifications. Uh, in our experience, in particularly in dental college, we get all types of fracture, and even we are working out, we are studying the pattern of fractures to get a new classifications uh, because I don't think this works anywhere now. the most near possible leopard one i got is this sickle cell uh, injury perfect cut over here so uh, this is the uh, almost a sort of classical leopard one of course this is a high leopard one here on the left side uh, that is a clear cut classical cut this uh, this was the nearest leopard one classical leopard one according to leopard one i have seen uh, uh, in my uh, short career so the incision has been clearly made by a raspin and all we have to do even the leopard osteotomy also has been made by the sickle all we have to do is go and just fix the plates and then suture it up now how you are going to do the fracture management it's about always reduction fixation and immobilization that is the basic of anything reduction can be either direct or indirect and fixation again can be direct or indirect and uh, the special instruments for dealing with maxilla as you all know is a rose maxillary disinfecting forceps it is a paired forceps you cannot use it as a single one it is a paired forceps with a uh, specific shape which is of practical use you have this elongated or u shaped portion this goes into the oral cavity this gives space for the dentition to go in and this arm uh, almost looking straight goes to the nasal floor and this is how you have to pull right from behind This goes to the nasal pore and this goes this way. And it's a pad instrument, one on each nostril, 
and we have a curvature which goes up always. This indicates up. That has to be up. And it has a, a bend over here, which gives space for the hands also. So always uh, just uh, used to get used to this instrument, particularly PGs, because you'll be asked in the exams how to hold this, right? And always use a rubber cap or some protection on the palatal aspect because the blood supply to the palate is of the greater palatal supply. If you are going to crush this with your instruments and it is going to be uh, injured, there is all possibility of getting a uh, maxillary necrosis or a palatal necrosis completely will go off because the blood supply is cut off. Because already of the fractures, uh, they may not have blood supply from the other, but palatal supply will be there. So in order to prevent uh, blood supply to go off, use a rubber cup like this protection seal on the oral cavity alone. And there is another forceps called a state and billion forceps. This, you can use it along with your row zygomat, I mean, uh, maxillary disinfectant forceps like this. This is used particularly in case of a palatal split. The palate is quite uh, wide open. You just compress this uh, along like this on using the buccal aspect of the occlusal surface, compress, and then you can just lock it up once it is uh, in reduced position. And along with the maxillary disinfectant forceps, you have to use this state and billion forceps. And uh, <clears throat> how do you classify the fixation of maxilla? You have an internal fixation and an external fixation if a maxilla is fractured. For internal fixation, you have suspension wires and the direct osteosynthesis. And external fixation, you have a cranium mandibular fixation and a cranium maxillary fixation. Internal fixation is about suspension wires. Um, Various types of wires, occlusal basic arch bar is a mandatory for all uh, suspension, even for uh, osteosynthesis, uh, you need a arch bar fixation. Um, make an arch bar, make an IMF, and then you can suspend the maxilla because the maxilla is going to float in between the cranium and the mandible. So you have to sandwich in between the mandible and the maxilla and always fix it to the fixed cranial base. If you are going to do an IMF alone, the mandible keeps moving and the, so it gives way for the uh, movement with, between the fractures of the maxilla. So always don't do an IMF alone for a maxillary fracture, uh, even though you get an occlusion, but that won't be a proper reduction of your maxilla. So always you have to fix the maxilla to the cranial phase. Depends on what types of fracture, you can use different size of suspension wires. This is a classical circumzygomatic suspension. All you have to do is pass an awl, that is an instrument which can go beneath the zygoma and over the zygoma, and then the wire is passed around and then fixed like this here in the arch bar, right? While removing, you just cut close to here and then pull the other wire, it'll easily come out. So that is the circumzygomatic wiring. This can be done either way. You can either pass the hole through this way, come out this way, put a wire and then take it back and then pass the hole again on the outer surface of the zygoma, come again to the same hole, insert the other end of the wire and then pull it through, either this way, or you can use it from top. You can just penetrate from the skin, just below the zygoma, and then take it out again, put the other end of the wire, connect with the awl, and then pass it outside the zygomatic arch and then bring it in. Either way, you can do this circumatic suspension. And this is called a thoma suspension. In case of a leopard, uh, if the zygomatic arch also is fractured, you cannot use a circumzygomatic wiring. Circumzygomatic may be used for leopard one and maybe two also if the arch is not fractured. But if the arch is fractured, you can use this. Uh, outer rim of the frontal bone, right? Most often, this also will be fractured. So the exposure, you can use the single exposure for that also. Just put a bar hole here and then put a wire into this. Then you pass the wire around the behind the zygoma bone, zygomatic body of the zygoma, and then come like this. This is called as a uh, frontal suspension, lateral frontal suspension. Again, you can use the same all for getting this wires. This is called as a frontal, lateral frontal suspension. And some other suspension, right, you can use an infraorbital rim or you can use a pyriform rim, pyriform aperture, and sometimes uh, through the maxilla itself. Infraorbital wiring also is possible. So what are the types of suspension for different fractures? Front, central, and lateral you can use. Leopard 3 and Leopard 2 fractures, you can use this type of suspension. And the circumzygomatic you can use for the Leopard 1 always. And if the zygomatic arch is not fractured along with the Leopard 2, you can use for Leopard 2 fracture also. And uh, zygomatic infraorbital and pyriform are all uh, confined to Leopard 1 fractures alone. Um, most of the times, um, we cannot uh, apply this as an old uh, treatment plan because still it is in use because uh, we get a lot of community fractures, particularly mid-phase. 
and particularly there will be sometimes soft tissue injuries and sometimes particularly like this covid times right you cannot go in for if you don't get a theater and if you cannot uh, afford to get operated um, they also can be done with the suspension wires and it 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 works really well it's not like any compromise treatment or something like that sometimes it may be the best treatment more than the or uh, osteosynthesis so this has to be learned by every uh, pgs and graduates and also delegates so this is this plays even a significant role even nowadays it's not like a old historical part and this is one type of example like a pediatric fracture who has a bullet cord injury right through cut through right here and a fourth one so all we have to do is a arch bar wiring and a circumzygomatic wiring for this baby and uh, she was perfectly all right after a few months so you, you cannot do a, a mini plate osteosynthesis for this girl so still all these suspension wires are in very much in place and striker must be wondering when i am emphasizing so much on uh, <coughs> suspension wires so direct osteosynthesis plates and screws for mid face the amount of uh, work done in uh, direct osteosynthesis nowadays right depends on the shape of plates and uh, the strength of the plates and uh, the ease of uh, working can come very easy so uh, it's it's almost 90% of 75% of the cases we can do a mini plate osteosynthesis easily with our recent plating systems which comes with all safe types and safes and also for conveniently use uh, you can have an assorted plates always always have an assorted plating system with you so that you can use uh, you can choose your plates on the table and then conveniently fix all types of uh, fractures this is how we fix a leopard one you have a four point fixation you use the nasomaxillary buttress and a zygomatic buttress four points like a classical leopard one of uh, uh, leopard one osteotomy of orthognathic surgery this is how we fix the um leopard one if it is comminuted use a different kind of plates and then fix the particularly concentrate on the buttress if you fix the pillars like nasomaxillary and the zygomatic buttress with a proper occlusion that should be it so this is the point of fixation of uh, leopard one this is an example of how you go about leopard one fracture fixation plain simple and then you can even release the imf so that the patient will go back to his normal life again leopard two fractures again the approaches various approaches like subciliary tarsal intraorbital and subconjunctival approaches for leopard 2 that uh, deals with the intraorbital rim and you may have to do a coronal approach if there is a concomitant uh, cranial injuries or uh, you have to fix the nasal bones you, you can use an acronal approach or a glabella simpler incision in near the glabella h or a open skiving whatever incision you can fix up there so you have to fix the nasal bone the intraorbital rim and the zygomatic buttress for a classical leopard 2 fracture and leopard 3 again you can you should have a lateral eyebrow approach upper eyelid or a lateral eyebrow because there is invariably the fz fracture fz region gets fractured over there or you can use a coronal approach and a preauricular approach the zygomatic arch is also involved or a hemi coronal approach if both side is approach then you do the uh, disimpaction reduce the fracture and that fixation goes like this you have to fix the nasal part mostly intraorbital region won't be uh, disturbed in case of a classical craniofacial disruption so you can avoid that intraorbital sort of incisions you can use a lateral eyebrow incision fix the episcular suture and fix the zygomatic arches so these are the points where you are going to fix for a leopard 3 and these are all some historical fact we thought it is historical extracranial forms of fixation halo frame box frame and the levon frames but it turns to hot now haunt us again now in the form of distraction osteogenesis so we do a bit learn about this also about all these halo frames and the box frames to get into the distraction mode the next one will be a zygomatic fracture the zygoma has two parts the zygomatic arch and the body um the <coughs> zygomatic arch will be classical mostly it will be like a a uh, fist injury the injury is going to be like a fist injury or a blunt injury isolated zygomatic arch get fractured like this uh, it can fracture into two three places usually um, the patient will complain of inability to open the mouth because of the depressed arch impending on the coronoid process that is the reason for uh, reducing this fracture and also they will have a uh, depressed cheek bone with a tenderness on the uh, malar prominent region or the zygomatic region so the reason for interfering with this is because of the dimple chin i mean dimple cheek 
and also your limited mandibular movement. So this is the classical X-rays. Again, review the arch classically depressed here. This is the this is the normal arch. This is the depressed arch. All you have to do is just elevate and then leave it as such if it is stable. It's called as a bucket handle view or a submento vertex view. That is the view which we use for zygomatic arch fracture. And zygomatic body fracture, it's called as a tripod fracture or a tetrapod fracture. It involves the uh, frontozygomatic region, infraorbital region, zygomatic buttress, and the zygomatic arch. This is the four regions which get fractured so that your like, entire zygomatic body gets displaced. Most commonly, the zygomatic fractures is associated with orbit fracture. So, since there is a seminar exclusively coming for orbital fracture, I'm not going to deal much about orbit. So, we'll stick to zygoma alone. How do you classify? There are a lot of classification about zygoma. I feel this is more safe and simple. Fracture stable after elevation, that is arch only, or and if it is body, if it is around the vertical rotation, around the vertical axis, either the zygomatic body will be medially rotated or laterally rotated, and fractures unstable after elevation, that is arch only, or rotation around the horizontal axis inferiorly and superiorly, and dislocation end block. The total entire zygoma is displaced totally end block, either it can be inferior or medial or lateral. And commutator zygomatic complex. Commutator fracture zygomatic complex includes the maxilla, so it's always be involved along with the maxilla. The zygoma also will be crushed. That is called as a classical zygomatic maxillary complex fracture. How to examine the zygoma? Again, follow the same rule like supraorbital rim and the zygoma infraorbital rims, uh, palpate from behind, and also feel from inside the mouth around the zygomatic buttress. You can feel a step deformity clearly in all these regions, and sometimes you can feel the zygoma is totally depressed on the side of the fracture. It will be lower than the other side. You can even see by inspection the malar prominence is depressed. When you're going to do indicate for the zygoma is not often, um, sometimes you can just uh, keep it under observation. You don't treat it at all, zygoma, because uh, uh, mostly it won't get displaced much and it won't cause much clinical significant also because mouth opening will be normal there won't be any anatomic difference there won't be any um, any other issues so it will be tricky whether you want to intervene or you don't want to intervene but there is an obvious fracture so always look for visual compromises if it is an zygomatic fracture and uh, ocular muscle functions flow orbital floor and displacement of fracture comminator of fractures where there is an impingement of any important structures or a restricted mandibular movements or improbable nerve dysfunction. These are all the indications for the surgery. Improbable nerve dysfunction, again, it's a bit tricky one. <laughs> How to go about reduction of the zygoma fracture? There are various approaches. Either you can elevate the zygoma with their vestibular approach, or it is called as a barosupramanian approach. Use a elevator. There are a lot of elevators, rose zygomatic elevator, tail among pattern of bristles. Use an elevator, place an incision just 3 and 5 mm superior to mucogingiva junction of the uh, almost molar region premolar to molar region, just insert your elevator and then rise the zygoma or zygomatic arch, whichever is fractured. An upper eyelid approach, it's called as a Keynes approach. Usual routine, what you do for a lateral eyebrow uh, approach, just open up. You can use an in elevator through this incision into the zygomatic arch and the body, and then you can use a elevation. That is called as a tiny man's approach. Another classical approach is the Gillies temporal approach. Uh, this is the rose. Gillis uh, gross elevator of zygoma. It has got uh, this elevator arm and also a handle for easily to lift it up. This other uh, instrument is the Bristow's elevator, which doesn't have a handle. That is the difference between the uh, rose elevator and the Bristow's elevator. This handle uh, makes it easy not to give a leverage on the temporal bone. In case if the temporal bone or any other skull bone is fractured, you're not supposed to get a leverage over it while elevating a zygoma. This handle clearly helps in elevating the zygomatic arch of the bone alone. All you make an incision, 45 degree angulation to the ear, right? So it, this, the significance of this being because of the superficial temporal artery goes and then branches into the anterior and the posterior division. So this incision ideally should be in between the two divisions, two terminal branches of the uh, superior temporal artery, and it should be almost parallel to it, so that you won't avoid, uh, you will avoid cutting those injuries and incorporate the unnecessary bleeding. So how do you make an incision where uh, you make an incision on the skin and then the subcutaneous tissue 
and then go to the fascia. Once you can see clearly the fascia, temporal fascia, and then you cut incisal the fascia. Now we insert the elevator in between the fascia and the temporalis muscle. The fascia is attached to the deeper part of the zygomatic arch, and uh, your temporalis muscle straightly goes into the coronoid process. So there is there exists a space between the uh, fascia and the temporalis muscle. That is the passage you are supposed to enter in for the elevating the zygomatic arch. So insert your periosteal elevator rows. I mean, move out periosteal elevator, reach the arch. Then take it off, use that as a guidance, and then use your uh, zygomatic uh, elevator into that. Once you can uh, flap this handle and then check for the uh, corresponding tip where it lies. If it is below the arch, then you can elevate easily like this, right? So that the zygoma gets elevated. Remember, always zygoma doesn't need an elevation. Suppose the zygoma is um, um, medially rotated. On the vertical axis, then there is no point in elevating the zygomatic body. You cannot, I mean, through this approaches, through all these approaches, you have to go in for a direct reduction of the zygoma. You have to open up the intraorbital region and then reduce it, or through the intraoral approach, you have to reduce. Just don't. Uh, all zygoma doesn't need a blind elevation like that thing, right? It depends on the fracture. So don't just. Uh, I've seen people obsessed with uh, zygomatic elevation. Um, for whatever case it is. So just open up and then put a blindly uh, elevator and then keep lifting. There is no point in doing this. I've seen my, even my PG is doing it. So always look for the fraction. Clearly, it's all it's all common sense where you need to reduce. So that's how you have to play with your zygomatic elevator. So again, there are some other uh, instruments which can be used for zygoma. That is Bosphilo's bone hoop. And insert with the stab incision below the cheek below the zygoma and then hooked it and then you can just elevate the zygoma and reduce the fracture. And there is something called as a carol Gerard screw where you can again use a stab incision, screw it into the zygoma and then lift it up. These are all percutaneous approach. And you can use it uh, Keen's approach also. <coughs> that is Keen's approach again an intro or approach where you can elevate the zygoma. Just a buckle sanctuary incision. Similar way like your Gillies temper, it's on the opposite side. Queen's approach is another approach for a zygomatic elevation where you make an incision on the anterior border of the ramus. That is called as a lateral coronoid approach. Again, the same way because it just goes along with the temporalis muscle and then elevate the zygoma. That is called as Queen's approach. Again, once the fracture is reduced and if the zygoma is unstable, then you have to fix the zygoma. Either you can use a transosseous wiring or a mini plates and an external fixators. Transosseous wiring, wherever the fracture is, just drill barrel holes and then you can fix up the parts and mini plates and screws again depends on the uh, site of fracture or uh, various micro plates are available particularly we use micro plates and uh, remember a point you don't use a long screws lengthy screws above the FZ suture because you enter into the brain so always this screws size does matter don't uh, all you can get away with the six mm screws even eight mm sometimes might be tricky always be, uh, beyond the FZ suture don't use a Longer screws or lengthier screws, just confined with the 6 mm screws, don't go beyond it because you can enter into the potential brain space. So that is the only point which you have to keep in mind over here. And orbital floor is always a different topic together that can be dealt in another seminar. I'm not going to deal with orbital floor and mostly, but it will be, uh, you have to deal with orbital floor in most of the zygomatic fractures. And the proper reduction of the zygomatic fracture, always you have to see this phenobaratine suture. That is the main point where you can see if that is reduced, that means you have reduced your zygoma to perfection. The rest, all places are arbitrary, improbable, buttress, or any other region is not going to be fine. You have to always check for the phenotype and future line for your zygoma to know if it is properly reduced. And this is, in short, the Triton algorithm for other type fractures. Uh, reduce the fracture and then see if it is stable. Just elevate the fracture, see if it is stable, and you can just stop. You may not open or anything do about it. Uh, the treatment will be over. And if you are unsure of protection, then you have to open up and then see how it is going to happen. Either you open transorally and then see and then reduce the fracture again directly. See if it is stable. If it is not stable, then plate it at the is it and buttress, zygomatic buttress region. You just put a plate and then see if it is reduced and stable. Then you can stop. Again, if it is not reduced, if the fracture is reduced and stable, it stop. If you are unsure of protection, then open out the other region, lateral orbital rim intraorbital regions, open up all these regions, check for reduction and also stability, and then put a plate across all the three points 
and then stop. This is how you proceed with the zygomatic uh, body fractures. Uh, another one is about nasal fractures. I'm not going to deal much uh, detail into this. This is because invariably a nasal bone gets fractured in all of the mid face fractures because that is the most prominent bone. Nosing ahead, that is the why you have a nosing ahead because that is the most prominent bone and it gets injured often, if not all the time. So you have to address your nasal bone fractures. And the timing of surgery also depends for nasal bone fractures. Uh, there are three types of like tiparous, lately displaced, not displaced. I think uh, we will deal with this because we have some cases. I think uh, KKSR will elaborate on your nasal, uh, dealing with nasal fractures. Just know about it. There's nasal bone. You have to examine the nasal bone. And you can simply reduce by using a ash forces and a volsham forces to reduce the nasal bone at the time of uh, reducing a maxilla or a zygoma and easy to fix. This is some case of nasal bone fractures, which is done by a open reduction because it reported late. That's classical deviation and it's almost straight. Similar, this one, almost similar fracture, but he reported earlier. So this was done by a closed reduction and see the result. It's quite easy if you do it early. And timing of surgery. We know how to do the surgery and what to do for the surgery. Now we want to know when you want to do the surgery, when the maxillofacial surgeon should jump in. Always look for a head injury. If there is a CS of prinoria, you have to wait for the neural opinion and then proceed for the surgery. So how do you know whether this is CSF rhinorrhea, you have this tramline pattern or a hollow sign uh, by using a tissue paper or something like that. The blood, which is, uh, and then the CSF, clear fluid around it. But the proper uh, pathognomonic sign or a test for a CSF rhinorrhea is beta 2 transferrin isoenzyme. This is the most uh, diagnostic test of all to confirm the CSF of rhinorrhea. And timing of repair again, when do you want to repair? Always. Uh, get the first opportunity. Whenever you are provided with the opportunity at the earliest, that is the best time to intervene. Again, it depends on a lot of factors. Uncounted by other injuries, uh, other physical injuries like a neurosurgery or a chest injury or whatever it is. So that, that takes always a priority. But always be there from the front and then jump into any opportunities you are presented with because that is the best time to get the best results. First 28 to 48 hours is always the best. But if there is an edema, wait for some edema to subside and then uh, Get it done with the first two post-operative weeks. That is the best time to do. Uh, because after that, uh, your fragments will be uh, only in a proper position because of uh, there will be a callus formation because maxilla is a very thin bone. So there will be easy fibrous callus formation and some of them will be lost due to evanations and there will be soft tissue scarring and the periosteal contraction will also be there. So it's difficult to get a primary closure in, uh, in case of uh, delayed uh, repair. So get an opportunity to get in at the earliest. So that is the best time to do the surgery, uh, provided if everything is all right. If the clearance is uh, fine with other departments, get the first opportunity. Don't wait for a prolonged period or for them to treat all the diseases and then come back to you. So always be there around as a team and then use any opportunity to get the uh, treatment done at the earliest. And uh, another important factor is about sequencing of pan patient trauma management because mid phase fracture is always a complex of multiple bone fractures. It won't be like a single fracture, as I said. The classical Laporte one or a zygoma won't happen often. You have to deal with other fractures of other bones as well. So, how do you do it? There are a lot of concepts and theories. Uh, there is no like uh, um, particular uh, thing which is called as a best. So, you have to think about so situations and whatever this. Uh, case scenario and then decide. But you have to know all the concepts. There is an outside and in concept because you fix all the outside fractures and then fill in the details of middle part. Another one is inside out concept. So what are the key contributors? What are the things you have to decide which makes you to do the things? There is uh, the central facial width. It has the naso, orbito, ethmoid complex, palate and the mandibular arch that provides the central width of the face. You have a lateral width of the face with the frontal bar, zygomatic arches, malar bone and a mandibular angle. This forms the lateral facial width. And the anteroposterior projection, that is the projection of the face that is given by the frontal bar, that is of the frontal bar of the nasal bone, frontal nasal maxillary buttress, zygomatic arches, mandible, angle to symphysis, and the facial height. Facial height is formed by the frontal bone, mid face buttress, mandibular angles, and the content. These are the key contributors of the face. You have to address each and every thing to get a proper symmetry and a proper face. Again, the face is divided into upper and lower half, either at leaf foot one level. So imagine a fracture at a leaf foot one. Above it is called as an upper half, lower, I mean upper face, and below it is called as a lower face. Again, the lower face is divided into two units, subunits, that is an occlusal unit and a mandibular unit. Occlusal unit 
plate, palate, dentition, and alveolar process. Mandibular unit is your body's and face and other things. And upper face, which we are dealing with today, the cranial unit that depends on the frontal, anterior temporal bones, the orbital rims, and the orbital roots and frontal sinus. And the upper mid face, which we deal with today, zygoma laterally, mesoethmoid, centrally and medially, and lateral inferior most of the orbits. And occlusion. Uh, mostly the heart palate, right? If there is a split in the heart palate, reduce the heart palate first. So you get the lower central facial width. That will guide you uh, to fix the mandible in proper occlusion. Because unless you have a guidance of a heart palate, because that's a stable structure, you cannot reduce the mandible in position. So always fix the heart palate first, then reduce the mandible, and then go about fixing the occlusion. So lower face, central face fracture exposed, reduce and rigid fixedly. Check for occlusion. Once this occlusion is fine, then you can fix up the mandible. You can uh, deal with the uh, paracetamol phases, uh, uh, condyles, and sub subsequent you can fix up the mandible. Once lower face and occlusion is fine, then you go for the cranial unit. That is the upper part of the cranium. Uh, frontal bone is reduced first, superorbital rim, and the naso, uh, frontonasal region. Once you get this into stability, then go for the upper mid face. So upper, once the stable cranial base is formed, you can build up the mid face around the stable cranial base. Frontal bone bar has been stabilized so that you can fix your zygomatic buttress, zygomatic bone, I mean, zygomatic frontozygomatic bone into the uh, reduced frontal bones and the nasal bones also into the frontonasal regions. Then you can fill in the details. Once the outer skeleton is fixed, your cranium and the mandible and all the zygomatic arches are fixed, then you can do it in the middle part of the region. That is your naso, uh, <coughs> nasoethmoid region. You can fill up all these, fill in all these fine details. Once this, this all the part are stable, you can fill in all the details and do the refined works because this is not going to be stable if you're going to do this initially. So always fracture all these, pick all these things and then come over here. Right. Again, there is two other concepts, bottom up, inside out, and top down, inside out. Uh, this again uh, works better in different hands and also depends on situations. This bottom up is like fixing up the mandible first. There is a concept of fixing up the mandible first. First, as I said, fix up the palate first and then uh, make an IMF, then go about fixing the mandible. Uh, again, there is a controversy whether to do the occlusal part first or the condyle first. Uh, there are arguments on both sides. So either fix the mandible. So this lower part is fixed. Then you fix up the upper part, all the frontal nasal cranium, everything. Now you have fixed both these and then you can fill in the mid part. That is the bottom up inside out theory. And another theory is top down. Fix the cranium, start from doing here. Fix the cranium first, arches, and then uh, maxilla to this um, frontal bone and then the occlusion and then the mandible. This is a top down and outside in concept. So the advantage of top down outside in concept is uh, open treatment of condyle may not be always necessary because everything has been fixed, the occlusion has been fixed. You may get off with the elastics and uh, you need not open the condyle. But if you want to do it from uh, down below, I mean from below upward, you need a stable mandible. You cannot leave the condyles open. So the condyle definitely have to be fixed if you are going to go from bottom up. So that is one advantage of top to bottom. Uh, <coughs> right. This is a schematic rotation of top to bottom. First, fix this frontal bones, nasal bones, uh, lateral part of the uh, uh, orbital rims. So the entire upper half has been fixed. Then fix the maxilla, nasomaxillary buttress, zygomatic buttress. Now the entire upper half is fixed. And then you can reduce the palate also with the arch bar. Now fix the mandible. Once in occlusion, fix the symphysis and the condyles. This is the top down and outside in concept. And this is the bottom up. Once mandible is fixed, fix the arch bar, fix the palate first, fix the arch bar, put it in IMF, then reconstruct the mandible first, and then go gradually upwards. This is bottom up and inside out region. So neither one of these techniques will achieve optimum results in every situation because sometimes you may have a shattered mandible, so you cannot start fixing with the mandible. Sometimes you may have a shattered uh, upper face. So shattered bone always comes to the last. Imagine a photo frame. If it is broken, we always fix the frame first, right? You have the bigger pieces assembled, get the bigger pieces assembled first, bigger and uh, definite pieces assembled first. Then you fill in all the details. Then you uh, assemble the outer framework, 
fill in the larger place, fix all the larger pieces together, and then fill in the minute details. That is how uh, that is that works better uh, in uh, in our experiences. Uh, always outside in is my concept. Uh, so it's always better, but it can be uh, either way. So it depends on clinical situations. We'll deal with this. How to we have in a, some cases presentations uh, KKR that is going to present later on. How to go about in each and every situations. And a special mention about anesthesia. All these mid face fractures, bearing leopard one, uh, you cannot have a nasal uh, intubation, which we routinely do for all of our uh, patient maxillary surgeries, because invariably the nose will be fractured, and uh, intubation might be difficult if there is a nasal bone fracture, and also you have to fix the nasal bone as well, because if the tube is going to be in with the uh, in the nasal cavity, you cannot fix the nasal bone. So you always need a some mental anesthesia, which is almost by, it's a mandatory, it has become a mandatory one, and an easy, simpler procedures. You can do, go about it without undisturbed, uh, <clears throat> without any disturbance of the uh, in the tubes. Tracheostomy, of course, can be an option, but that's a difficult option. You don't need not do a tracheostomy for this simple reason. Nasal intubation, again, leopard one, you can do zygomas, you can do, uh, but mid face with the maxilla, uh, nasal is not going to happen. Sometimes you are not well versed with submental intubation. You can use a retromolar region. There, is, there might be some space behind the last molar. So you ask the anesthetist, uh, or you just personally do because invariably you have to do an IMF. You cannot do an IMF with the tube inside the mouth. You can push the tube on behind the lateral, uh, behind the uh, posterior surface of the last molar. If there is some space for the tube to sit in, you can use that space. See to that it doesn't kink. So you can use that space to get a proper occlusion. And if there is an owl screw, owl smaller or anterior, you can use that space to get the tube in out and get the IMF done. I'll show you how to uh, do a <coughs> submental intubation. It's a simple, just below the chin, a little bit lateral, make a stab incision using a lemon blade. Just half a centimeter of incision is enough. Just elevate with your uh, stout artery, just insert, just be as close to the bone on the medial aspect of the bone, insert your artery. Bring it out to the whole cavity, just pierce through the intraoral vision below the tongue on the floor of the mouth, as close uh, to the bone so that you avoid injuring any lingual duct or lingual or whatever it is. Bring your artery and then open up the forceps. First, bring in the cuff and then pull it out and then again insert through the same bone and always use a flexometallic tube. Uh, that is the best suited for a submental intubation. And uh, you have to remove the cuff even prior to your inserting them because cuff may be sometimes tight. Because after intubation, you may not be able to remove the, uh, the cuff of the uh, flexometallic tube. So always remove it in advance so that it can be easily removed. Because it's it, this has to be a smooth procedure and a quick procedure. Just insert, disconnect the tube, disconnect the cuff, and then put it here. I'll just show you a video. This is how you have to do. That, that cuff has been, I mean, the tube has been uh, disconnected. So the cuff, the connector has been removed here because you cannot uh, pull it through with the connector. So the connector has to be removed and uh, clamp it and then bring it in. The, the tube is outside. The tube is outside now. And then now connect the connector back and then connect it to the boils. So that's it, right? And uh, if you use a small incision, stab incision, this is snugly fit. I always secure this with some switches, right? Like uh, you fix a drain, you just fix this tube with the switches and always see to that it doesn't, the remaining part of the tube doesn't kick inside. So check with the anesthetist, check the air pin because uh, the, um, the measurement should be correct because the tube should not be in too far in or it should not be in, uh, into the correct, I mean, the proper position because always check with the anesthetist so the tube is in uh, correct position into the lungs after this procedure. Secure this and then once it is covered, it is not going to disturb in your area of surgery at all. <clears throat> right. Uh, with this, uh, I'll leave to KKSR for a case discussion. We'll discuss all the final concepts in the case, uh, case discussions. Uh, then I'll come back to you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Arun, for that uh, excellent and uh, very exhaustive. Uh, yeah. There are, there are few questions. I think we can take some questions and then yeah, we can take we can to the next question. We want to take yeah, now, yeah. sir, or because most of the questions will be answered in the case discussions. Uh, if you want to wait, or you want to take the questions right now, we will see what kind of questions they have. Okay, if it's related to basics, we can probably answer them and then go on to the cases. Okay, sir. Thanks. Yeah. yeah.
Emmanuel. It was a very extensive presentation, and it has evoked uh, a good interest. Emmanuel, can you be a bit louder? I'm not hearing you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah. So, like, you have evoked a lot of interest in uh, uh, conservative management. Yeah. And uh, like, you know, there are questions about. Uh, um, how do you do an infraorbital suspension? You know, is infraorbital suspension a different one, or it is the circumzygomatic one that? Uh... No, infraorbital. You make a hole in the infraorbital rim. Okay. That's how you. Uh, but that that doesn't. Uh, it is. We don't use most commonly because uh, circumzygomatic is quite simpler procedure, and your late to suspend the suspension is the most commonest one we use nowadays. We can deal with those two things uh, better. There, there is no other role for an problem uh, or a pyriform suspension. So we can get away with the simpler procedure like a circumzygomatic and a problem suspension. Yeah, That's okay. all I, artificial. Yeah, I also agree with Arun, you know. Uh, I think uh, uh, even even though we are uh, we are well trained and we are training our <laughs> Also, uh, we are training our postgraduates adequately with the use of rigid fixation with plates and screws. Uh, I think it is also important that they, they are taught or we still uh, know how to do the suspension wiring for various reasons that uh, where, uh, Arun has uh, already elaborated. What do you say, Arun? Yeah. Yes, sir. That so, is mandatory, sir. We cannot mandatory. ignore this. Yeah. Especially, especially I, because I also get to do a lot of this uh, trauma, fan facial trauma cases, you know, with a lot of head injury all that so initially when you want to stabilize these bones you know when you can't uh, directly put plates and at, at the primary uh, sitting it, it is useful to quickly do some suspension wiring and hold these uh, fragments together you know, to, so that they don't they are immobilized uh, till you take them up for uh, definitive surgery uh, do you agree to that yes sir. yeah and infraorbital uh, suspension is uh, all not, not necessary because if you if you if you are well versed with the lateral suspension or central suspension, lateral is both your circumzygomatic and the the thomas uh, suspension or the central suspension, or you can even do the pyriform suspension, you know, simple pyriform. Yeah, pyriform suspension. yeah. so these suspensions uh, techniques are very useful, very simple, and and a lot of situations uh, work very well, you know. Uh, before you do definitive uh, management with uh, rigid fixation, or in certain cases, just simple fractures like a, 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 a Lifford II, for example, you, know, you don't have to put plates, you just have to temporarily uh, suspend these uh, uh, bones and then get adequate, uh, uh, I think, fixation. Yeah. Especially when there is large combination and all, I think suspension wiring is more yeah, true. Yeah, combinations, combinations yeah, yeah. multiple fragments plus uh, so, lots of soft tissues. Well, Correct. and a lot Correct. of infections. Uh, almost, this is this is not like you know, it. Almost like fifty percent of the cases we should manage with uh, wires, I think. Especially in uh, some fractures which don't follow the pattern. Yeah. Uh, like Emily Fort or something, so, people you know, tend to ignore even. They don't yeah, find yeah. out that and just try to get away with the IMF. The suspension wiring plays a very important role. Important role. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. So, Dr. Arun, uh, in your presentation, you showed the suspension wiring yeah. with the wires from the mandibular arch bar. So, is yeah. it always from the mandibular arch bar? Yeah, or? always we use that because uh, if you tend to put the maxillary arch alone, right, there is every chance of going that maxilla to drift posteriorly into its original position. So, that's, it will be always a sandwiched, uh, maxilla should be sandwiched between the mandible and the cranium. So, that is the best way of going to do it because uh, the zygomatic arches and the lateral portal is a little bit behind from the arches. So it tends, when you tighten it, sometimes the maxilla will go behind. It won't stay in position. So it's always better to do a sandwich. That is the best. It's not better. That is the only way to do it. Either you can connect two wires, one for the maxilla and for the mandible, or you can straight away sandwich, do an IMF, uh, connect it to the mandibular wires, mandibular arch bar alone. Maybe what we do is sometimes we wait for uh, 15 days then disconnect the mandible wire, see if the maxilla is stable, and then leave it. So leave the maxilla wires alone, and then leave it for another 15 days, then cut off the maxilla wires also. That is how we go about it. But initially, it has to be with the mandible. You cannot do it with the maxilla alone. So you do the intermaxillary fixation first, and then do the yes. Man yes. suspension and then, from the mandible. Yes, sir. Mm. Okay. Okay, That's so it thing. also helps in IMF, intermaxillary fixation. Yes. 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 And, and uh, uh, like, yeah, I think uh, uh, 
post graduate should be aware of the immediate emergency management in mid, mid, uh, mid phase fractures when there is severe bleeding a good reduction immediately can stop it and even save the patient mm-hmm. that's to that's what i said no initially it yeah. helps really that's to stabilize right. the fractures yeah that's why maxilla patient tape should be there right from the beginning yeah. because uh, reduction of fractures post nasal bleed that's i had right. recently we had a case of severe post nasal bleed because of fracture we had to do and uh, stop the nasal bleeding by packing the nasal bone right so we have to guide even the ent people at gh there was severe bleeding uh, just a month prior to this covid we had a even very tough time. intubation there will be so much yes. of bleeding during intubation you yes. can do a reduction yes. yeah it's very easy for them to intubate and the patient will be so comfortable if you do a reduction even a simple wires or tension band wires the relief the patient gets is immense that's all but in these cases i think uh, i would really advise a tracheostomy isn't it yeah. i mean instead of trying your nasal or even oral intubation if it's going to be such a a uh, massive injury to the mid face and the ma- in most of these cases the ma- ma- mandible is also shattered you see it's so difficult to get them into a position yeah yeah that is another yes, point yes. to look out mid face yes. fractures will have most of the time even other injuries you know even cranial yes. part it will be high speed yeah. Yeah. high speed yeah. yeah so airway is very important at that point yeah okay so coming to the clinical features again how often do we find blindness associated with leaf for 2 and 3 fractures compared to zygomatic fractures uh, surprisingly not much uh, because uh, the optic foramen is way behind and it is well protected by the sound bone so surprisingly i don't see blindness maybe like what do you say i don't see blindness in almost 70 to 80% of the cases which i have seen i, I don't know what do you say sir Uh, yeah no no actually actually a uh, 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 lifor 3 lifor 2 is very rare yeah, i mean i have never yeah. seen but uh, lifor 3 what can happen is most of the time uh, uh, it passes either through the inferior superior fissures yes sir but very rarely it can go through the optic canal yeah okay. at that point uh, there is a possibility of i'll show you I, my my patient one patient which i want to show you in the end that poor fellow had the same problem no he 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 went blind because uh, the fracture okay. went through his optic the canal and then there was injury to the optic nerve so that is why i think all these patients uh, these uh, pan facial especially the pan facials with head injury uh, you should give priority to uh, to uh, you know ruling out injuries to the orbit and the injuries to the you know, uh, you know head and all that before even attempting to go ahead and immediately treat these fractures so very yeah good. it's very rare very rare i have had at least uh, two three patients who have lost their eyesight and all these patients have had the fracture going to the the optic canal and uh, causing injury to the okay it is very strange. less compared to zygomatic fractures right sir strange yeah, yeah. i have seen zygomatic. recovery also from uh, recovery also i have seen from loss of vision sir even uh, long fractures after reduction of fracture there seems to be some recovery of the vision and surprise actually particularly oh, really? i remember two or three cases which recover uh, which uh, recover vision also okay even after long term very very surprising yeah okay one last question sir uh, this is regarding using rose disinfection forces you know that high velocity injuries that we see today the maxilla is pretty uh, like you know uh, very much mild I mean, and do you use disinfection forceps on a routine basis or uh, like you know uh, it's as and when you need yeah. it no or do you use any other method to disinfect the maxilla no if uh, uh, rose disinfection forceps is i mean as it goes by the name it is required only when it is really impacted you know most of the time when it goes gets impacted posteriorly inferiorly and you are not able to mobilize it with your finger pressure you might have to so classically for a, you know straightforward a lifort 1 or a lifort 2 you might have to use but if it's going to be pan facial with uh, multiple segmentation i don't think it is possible and it is necessary to use rose what do you say arun yeah i don't use unless i get a i don't yeah. get if it is severely yeah. impacted i just do it with pull wires yeah. just connect some I, wires yeah yeah rose impaction this impaction i use it only for lifort 1 fractures and in fact i use it more for uh, lifort 1 osteotomies <laughs> than for yes. yeah though it was meant for the Uh, for treatment of lifort fractures yeah. i think it is more extensively used for uh, osteotomies to mobilize the segment yeah. and elastics works well to get that cushion for the elastics yeah. elastics work very well 
elastics is, yeah i think elastics is mandatory for all yes, these patients yes. if you want post operatively for at least a week to 10 days yes. unless you have those elastics you'll never be able to get whatever planning you do uh, you will never be able to get that occlusion without those elastics okay. again one more point i just want because of the suspension bias this has to be technically uh, difficult because uh, after the surgery you cannot leave the patient in imr so what we do is we don't connect the wires we don't connect the wires to the mandible right we use elastic we use uh, we just keep a uh, rolled up wires down the corner of the mouth we don't connect the wires to the mandible uh, we do it on the next day we give just elastic keep it in occlusion and then we fix it that is one difficulty in having a patient in a we are going to extubate the patient right if it is a tracheostomy it's fine but if you are going to extubate a patient uh, you cannot fix it in imr so we keep the wires outside we don't fix it to the mac we fix it to the maxilla around we don't fix it for the mandible the next day we fix it to the mandible after the extubation that is another point to be noted in case of suspension wires okay so we'll carry on with the presentation yes. okay thank you Okay, so uh, thanks once again, Narun, for that uh, very exhaustive uh, uh, presentation on uh, the basics uh, of uh, of uh, diagnosis, uh, imaging management, including anesthesia for uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, uh, nasal, uh, I mean, mid face fractures. Now, I am I am going to just uh, you know uh, I am not going to repeat any of uh, any of those uh, topics that uh, Dr. Arun has already uh, presented. Uh, what I am going to do is uh, uh, quickly sum up uh, his uh, presentation, and then we are we'll go on to discussing few cases. So we are going to uh, basically discuss only cases uh, with uh, zygoma fractures, or zygoma fractures of the uh, the 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 maxilla, and uh, we'll briefly discuss some nasal bone fractures. So, so now, uh, as uh, he has already uh, uh, you know, discussed in detail, the aims and principles of mid-face surgery. Okay? Now, it is to rapidly re-establish form and function. So these are the two most important reasons why you should be treating these uh, patients. Now, simple mid-face fractures where there is no loss of form, there is no, no loss of function, uh, a lot of times you can even manage them considerably. Now, how do you restore form? Restore form, you will have to restore the height, the width, the depth, and the projection. Okay, which means that we'll have to keep in mind the, the buttresses and restoring the buttresses in both the height, the width, the depth, and the projection will completely restore the form of the patient to a pre, pre morbid condition. And then, of course, the function. Okay. Unless we restore the function, there is no point in restoring the form. So we'll have to re-establish the occlusion, the nasal and orbital functions. Now to achieve this, we'll have to definitely expose the buttresses, direct exposure. And then we have to do open reduction of these uh, fractures at the buttresses and rigid internal fixation of buttresses with monocortical, uh, play, uh, monocortical mini plates. Now I also, I totally agree with Arun that uh, you can in a lot of uh, situations, manage these patients with suspension wiring and intermaxillary fixation. But there are specific indications when you might have to do rigid fixation with uh, monocortical mini plates. You might have also use uh, micro plates for smaller bones because the smaller bones uh, need small plates and small screws. Now, what is important, the reason why uh, rigid fixation is important is because sufficient stability prevents infection and a second surgery. So that seems to be <coughs> the most uh, important reason why we should be able, we should uh, uh, plan rigid fixation uh, for these patients. And of course, as uh, Arun said, and I also uh, say, the uh, conservative management for patients with a stable, simple, and close fractures uh, is also very important. So we'll have to uh, 
critically and uh, you know carefully evaluate these patients and decide which patient requires uh, open reduction fixation, which patient requires uh, a closed reduction and conservative management. So what will be the treatment sequence? So quickly, as uh, we've already uh, gone through in detail, is a detailed clinical examination, like the way Dr. Arun has uh, described. Imaging is very important. Now, uh, plain radiographs are useful. Uh, those were the days when uh, CT uh, was not available easily. So we used to uh, manage with plain radiographs, but now CT is mandatory, especially when we're dealing with uh, complex uh, mid-phase fractures. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the CTs, uh, the CT should be a non-contrast CT with thin sections, about one to two millimeters. And, uh, and then uh, based on your clinical examination and your diagnosis on the CT, you do your treatment planning to, and then you uh, do your procedure to reestablish the occlusion, uh, direct exposure fracture, open reduction, internal fixation, and very important to avoid intra-op complications. So intra, in, for example, when you're doing zygomatic complex fractures, you have to, you can avoid intra-op complications if you have the luxury of intra-op in, intra imaging. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not sure if any, any facility in our country has uh, uh, options to do a CT inside the operation theater. But there are certain situations where we can use the C arm, especially when you're doing zygomatic arts and zygomatic complex factor reduction to assess uh, if you have done adequate uh, uh, reduction and fix to go ahead with the fixation so that you can avoid a second surgery. It's also important intraoperatively to uh, make sure, especially while uh, uh, treating zygomatic complex fractures while reducing zygomatic uh, complex uh, uh, with uh, any of these procedures, the intraoral technique or the extraoral technique, to make sure that uh, the patient doesn't go into a bradycardia. So you always have to uh, coordinate with your anesthetist uh, during the elevation to avoid a, uh, a flow cardiac reflex uh, leading to bradycardia. And then, of course, post-operative care. Post-operative care is in the form of uh, uh, adequate uh, medication and, uh, if necessary, some steroids. So coming back to the facial buttresses, these are the facial buttresses that uh, uh, Dr. Arun has already uh, shown and described. You have the, uh, the, the stable bone, uh, uh, the buttresses along which you can use the uh, mini plates. You have the thinner bones, as I said, those thinner bones, uh, uh, you might have to use the micro plates. And uh, when, you use, uh, uh, when you use screws, uh, if, if uh, the patient can afford, if you have the luxury, of using this uh, self-drilling and self-trapping screws, I think that makes a lot of difference in fixation of these uh, fragments because uh, it is less traumatic and uh, uh, they hold the uh, segments together stably while fixing these uh, fixing these uh, uh, fracture segments uh, using these uh, uh, self-drilling or self-trapping screws. Okay, so now. Uh, so, uh, as we said, the, the facial buttresses, you have the horizontal and the vertical buttresses. The concepts and algorithms that were introduced to restore the buttresses of the facial skeleton improved our understanding and the surgical management of the fractures. But difficulty still exists in optimally re-establishing the CMF skeleton in three dimensions, resulting in facial asymmetry uh, when we use the traditional methods. So, in my opinion, I think we are still a little far away from achieving perfect restoration of form. At least function we are able to achieve to a great extent, but to achieve perfect pre-morbid uh, form, I think we're still a little far away. That's because of uh, the, the, the uh, difficulty we are facing with, uh, with the present system. I think uh, to, uh, if, we, if, if we can afford and uh, hopefully in the near future, uh, at least some of us, uh, some institutions can uh, give us this, uh, the luxury of uh, using intraoperative navigation. We should be able to achieve uh, better postoperative results, uh, and achieve better postoperative form and function, and uh, to, uh, to fulfill the expectations of the patient. Especially when when you're dealing with patients in a private setup, patients are very choosy, very. Uh, very picky, they want uh, their uh, preoperative, uh, I mean, pre morbid uh, form and uh, uh, facial aesthetic restaurant. I think it's very difficult in most of the situations. 
And I think the only solution is uh, intraoperative navigation. I think a couple of uh, our own surgeons have this uh, luxury in, in Chennai. Uh, I wish this can become more common. Okay. So now, uh, what are the stable bones uh, to fix uh, mini plates on these buttresses? So the stable bones, keep in mind that these are the stable bones where you can put your plate so that you can get rigid uh, fixity of uh, the fragments. The orbital rims, the zygomatic bones, the pyriform aperture, the zygomatic, zygomatic maxillary buttress, the zygomatic frontal buttress, and the zygomatic temporal buttress. So these are the six uh, uh, stable areas where you can rigidly fix your uh, mini plates and uh, uh, try to achieve restoring the form. Okay. Now, of course, as I said, CT is very, very important. You have 2D CT and 3D CT, and uh, it's very useful to have, like uh, Dr. Arun said, uh, 3D images to plan your surgery. So this is an example of a 3D CT of a typical uh, a simple zygomatic complex, a body fracture. You can see the uh, bones, uh, the, uh, the uh, fractures at uh, the uh, zygomatic frontal, the zygomatic temporal, the zygomatic maxillary, and the intraorbital. And uh, you should also, to, uh, to plan fixation, you can decide to do either a two point, three point, or sometimes a four point fixation, but you'll have to make sure that the zygomatic temporal suture is evaluated. Uh, adequately if you want to reduce and uh, uh, the zygomatic complex fracture completely. And in, in certain situations, you might have to fix it at the zygomatic you know, suture line. Okay. Now, <clears throat> uh, this study by uh, Manson et al. Uh, in 1990 uh, towards CT-based uh, patient uh, fracture treatment, uh, very widely accepted and uh, followed, uh, uh, especially in, uh, in the United States. Uh, he, he divides uh, the, level, uh, the level of uh, injuries into low, middle, and high, high level of uh, high uh, inj uh, energy injuries. Low energy injuries require no treatment or can get away with simple treatment. Middle energy injuries, uh, injuries require standard surgical approaches and uh, uh, rigid injury fixation, whereas high energy injuries, which dramatic instability, multiple surgical approaches uh, is necessary to visualize and align and fix surgically. So I think this is a good article for postgraduates to uh, look up and uh, follow uh, for management of uh, when we decide the level of surgical intervention. Okay, so finally, uh, as I said, uh, the, what are the functional indications? What are the cosmetic indications? Functional indications, uh, this is with regard to the zygomatic complex fractures is the coronoid impingement, the changes of the globe position, visual, dis the visual disturbances, diplopia, and uh, the intraorbital nerve injury. But a cosmetic indications will be asymmetry, anophthalmos, orbital dystopia, and auscultations. So we'll have to uh, clearly define the indications and treat accordingly. Okay. Now, what is the treatment of displaced zygomatic fracture uh, fracture plating sequence. The first, first uh, uh, site to fix is the zygomatic temporal, uh, sorry, zygomatic frontal, the frontal zygomatic suture. The second in the comminuted zygom or zygomatic temporal. The third is the zygomatic maxillary. And finally, the orbital floor is the zygomatic phenol. So depending upon the, uh, the, 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 uh, the displacement, uh, after reduction, uh, based on the stability, after reduction, you always have to check intraoperative stability. As I said, uh, to avoid intra intraoperative complications, you will have to check for stability intraoperatively, and then based on the stability after reduction, you will have to decide whether to do a two point three point or a four point uh, fixation. But again, this plating sequence uh, uh, variation exists depending upon individual preferences and uh, depending on the nature and displacement of the fracture. Okay, so Arun, now we'll go on to the cases. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> any doubts so far, Emmanuel? Or shall we go? Okay. Sir, uh, I... yeah. yeah. Um, sir, in that sequencing, how important is fixing the arch? Like, you know, in the, the second one, you say it's a zygomatic temporal suture. So, 
yeah uh, uh, fixing the arch i think uh, fixing arch is not as important if, if it's quite stable now i'll show you some cases where we had to fix the arch you know, if, if it's unstable after reduction uh, uh, when it tends to and especially in cases where it's comminuted you'll have to definitely fix it but uh, most of the time i think we can get away with the zygomatic pro temporal suture fixation arun any comments from your side yes sir uh, as you said this this sequence should be fine this is what we follow sir this is what you follow then yeah. yes okay so this is a case of uh, uh one minute okay. okay this is a case of uh, uh, lefort 1 2 and 3 with a zygomatic complex structure why is it not moving okay okay so this is a case of uh, you know uh, 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 a blunt injury over his face not a not a, uh, a road traffic accident uh, i think he uh, it was an assault and uh, he presented to us uh, with this uh, uh, with uh, this uh, clinical uh, picture okay he had a, a kind of a moon faces uh, his uh, left uh, uh, left zygomatic uh, bone was depressed he had a left uh, uh, circumzygomatic uh, uh, edema with the subcondylar ecchymosis his occlusion yeah so this was his occlusion he had uh, uh, i won't say very gross mal occlusion but he, he had an open bite his mouth opening was restricted and uh, then uh, uh, we did uh, have not put uh, the uh, in the pictures of the images but uh, this was uh, diagnosed uh, with uh, as uh, yes, yes. okay so this was uh, the malocclusion with which he presented uh, based on uh, the routine clinical examination and uh, the uh, ct and radiograph we diagnosed him as a case of uh, uh, lefort 1 2 3 uh, with uh, the left zygomatic complex fracture so the treatment we adopted was uh, you know um, as uh, i was telling uh, since it was also a lefort 1 and his occlusion was uh, Uh, mildly deranged we thought the uh, best thing was to use a, uh, uh, use the rose disimpaction forceps uh, to disimpact and bring it into occlusion <clears throat> and then uh, uh, we did a, a fixation uh, like a routine uh, classical uh, lefort 1 uh, fixation at uh, the uh, the pyriform rim on either side and the zygomatic uh, buttress on either side and we routinely use uh, uh, the splints you know uh, uh, the splints uh, which we fabricate uh, in, uh, uh, cad cam uh, planned uh, splints uh, so that uh, uh, the occlusion we achieve uh, uh, quite good and perfect and uh, then uh, we also did uh, the classical uh, uh, fixation at the left uh, frontozygomatic suture and then uh, the intraorbital rim on either side the right side we use the transconjunctival and left side we use the the uh, the uh, lid incision and then we fixed uh, at uh, both the frontozygomatic uh, uh, and the intraorbital rims 
and this is the uh, result we got after uh, post operative so uh, as uh, as i was saying uh, the uh, result is quite good but uh, if you say if you see his uh, uh, he still seems to have some kind of uh, edema and fullness on his face so we are hoping that that will settle down over a period of time but uh, i still feel uh, that uh, perfect uh, restoration of form uh, to a pre uh, morbid uh, condition i think we have to use uh, more advanced techniques uh, to to plan and uh, fix this fracture difference. Okay. Now, this is a case of uh, three-point fixation. This is a straightforward uh, zygomatic complex, left side, uh, uh, right side zygomatic complex fracture uh, with all the classical uh, signs and symptoms of zygomatic complex. And we plan to do a three-point fixation at the frontozygomatic, uh, the, uh, the zygomatico maxillary and the zygomatico temporal. So this this is uh, as uh, Emmanuel you asked me. You see this is uh, what we've done, and now uh, we have uh, kind of uh, mastered the art of fixing these uh, uh, these plates on the zygomatic arch uh, through an intraoral trans uh, trans uh, cheek approach. And in fact, I should say Eleven is doing a lot of uh, these cases, and uh, he seems to he seems to have good results uh, with this kind of fixation. So it's not necessary always to open the zygoma completely unless it is uh, comminuted from uh, a grass combination. Then you might have to do an open reduction to a pre-auricular or in some case a hemicoronal hemi approach. But uh, we find uh, quite uh, we find uh, the results are quite good when we do simple uh, fixation of uh, using a two-hole or a four-hole plate on the zygoma through a trans trans buckle and trans cheek approach. You know, using a trocar and uh, and to a okay, so that's the result we have uh, after uh, uh, reduction fixation at three points. So we, we avoided uh, fixing at the intra uh, uh, okay. Now, uh, uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for us in, in private uh, uh, setup like uh, where we work uh, in the, in the uh, institution in the college, we get to see a lot of uh, malunited fractures. Because, uh, uh, since we are not on the main road, on the highway, we don't we get to see a lot of malunited fractures or uh, either treated elsewhere or not treated. They come to us for uh, treatment of these fractures. So uh, it's also important to know how to manage uh, malunited fractures of uh, the patient's skeleton. Because not always that you uh, see fresh cases. So how do you manage malunited? So this is a patient uh, with a zygomatic complex fracture, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which he had a few years back. And then he came to us uh, for, uh, uh, for the correction of his uh, post-traumatic defect. So what we planned was, uh, these are the uh, cases where it's very useful to uh, use your uh, 3D uh, uh, CT and then uh, uh, do a uh, rapid prototyping uh, a stereolithic model. And then you plan your surgery uh, on the model, you pre-adapt the uh, plate for fixation, and then it becomes very easy to, uh, to, uh, to uh, operate on these patients because your, everything is uh, ready in hand, uh, uh, especially when it comes to uh, fixating devices. Uh, but of course, the, uh, the approaches to the skeleton uh, for these uh, uh, fractures uh, remain the same as what we do for uh, cases uh, with uh, fresh trauma. Okay. So that is uh, what we could uh, achieve. Uh, uh, this was also done, uh, uh, you know, though it was a very long plate, we were able to fix it uh, 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 intra or the uh, trans cheek, uh, you know, uh, trans buckle, trans cheek uh, with a proper and cannula. Okay, that's his uh, result uh, post operative. A case of uh, malunited uh, arch fracture, so there's not ar arch fracture. Okay? So if you see her uh, facial width, you see the left side, the, the uh, face is wider than the right side because the uh, untreated uh, outward displaced uh, fracture of the zygomatic arch. She came to us, I think, uh, a few years after she sustained this injury. And then we planned again, uh, we used a 3D model to plan uh, 
to pre-adapt the plate, but this, this patient required, uh, since it is uh, old fracture, it is not possible to do a close reduction. So we had to necessarily do an open reduction. So we did an open reduction through a pre-auricular approach, uh, osteotomized the, uh, the, uh, uh, the fragment, uh, the zygomatic arts, the displaced zygomatic arts, and then fixed the plate. The, 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 the reason why it became easy was because we were able to pre-adapt the plate on the uh, studio-lithographic model, uh, osteotomized, uh, 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 osteotomized uh, arch on the studio-lithographic studio model. So it's really useful to use uh, these uh, uh, techniques uh, and uh, technology to the advantage of uh, our surgical outcomes. Okay? So that is the outcome after the surgery. And if you see, uh, she seems to have uh, regained her uh, normal facial width. Uh, seems to have, we have uh, uh, to a great extent restored her facial form. Okay. Now, an isolated uh, fracture of the zygomatic arch. Okay. So this is a very straightforward case. Uh, we did a uh, we did close reduction uh, uh, through the Gillis temporal approach, and then uh, through an intra. This is what uh, we said the intra or the trans cocktail trans cheek okay uh, if you have uh, any technical uh, doubts uh, i think you should call the preliminary because she's now doing uh, quite a lot of this in fact one of our post guys is doing a dedication of this and uh, seems to be working quite well uh, with uh, uh, or minimally, minimally invasive we never had any injuries to any nerves any uh, neurological deficits nothing so Sir, sorry to here. disturb you. Yeah, yeah. Can you just get your mic a bit closer, sir? It's uh... okay. Can you hear now? Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. You can hear now. Yes, sir. Okay. So that is the transbuckle buckle instrumentation plating of the zygomatic arch. So a simple uh, two-hole plate uh, is sufficient to fix this arch. So uh, that uh, that uh, I should be able to clear uh, Dr. Emmanuel's doubt whether to fix the arch or not to fix the arch. Uh, if you're going to do a zygomatic complex fracture uh, reduction fixation, if you're doing three point four point fixation, if you're three point fixation, you can still get away by not fixing zygomatic arch. But isolated zygomatic arch, grossly displaced, comminuted, or uh, old fractures, uh, delayed uh, treatment. Uh, for these uh, uh, these uh, uh, displacements, I think it's a good idea to do a zygomatic arch uh, uh, fixation using these plates. Okay, coming to uh, maxillary fractures, just uh, a case of a Lefort one. Uh, yeah, Lefort one fractures, uh, classic pure Lefort ones are uh, far and few, uh, but uh, I think they are the easiest of all the uh, maxillary fractures to treat. Uh, you can do either a close reduction fixation or a, uh, or a, a close reduction and immobilization, or you can do a uh, open reduction fixation. But now with the uh, with the availability of uh, uh, affordable uh, plates and screws, uh, of course, uh, in the institution because of uh, the of the uh, affordability levels of some patients, we still use uh, stainless steel plates and screws, but. If possible, we can use uh, uh, titanium plates and screws because uh, stainless steel invariably has to be removed at least theoretically after six months to a year. Uh, whereas in titanium, you can leave that. So that's a Lefort one classical. Uh, we did a uh, reduction uh, with uh, with a uh, rose disimpaction forceps, and, and that's the uh, uh, 3D uh, X-ray CT and. Uh, classical uh, you know, reduction with uh, disimpaction forceps and fixation at the 4.3, the, the pyriform rim and the uh, zygomatic maxillary uh, sites, so the buttress okay, that uses. And uh, as I was saying, it is, I think, almost uh, mandatory to use uh, elastics whenever you're doing uh, maxillary fractures, especially if you want to restore uh, good occlusion, uh, good, uh, uh, good function occlusion a period of one week to 10 days is always a good idea to put these patients on intramaxillary fixation, uh, uh, I mean, elastic traction. And that's the result you get after the elastic traction is removed. Okay. All right. 
so that was about uh, the uh, management of uh, zygomatic uh, fractures and the uh, the uh, lefort fractures the few cases that we have discussed uh, if you have any questions or i will quickly uh, go ahead and uh, show some nasal bone fractures and uh, what are the uh, salient features that or points that we should keep in mind when we are treating uh, fractures of the nasal bone and the complex any doubts no or shall we proceed we can proceed sir we can go ahead okay so uh, nasal bone as uh, dr arun said you know it, uh, it happens either as an isolated nasal bone fracture and uh, as we all know nasal bone is i think the the, the most common fractures uh, injuries that happens uh, on a day to day basis uh it can be either because of interpersonal violence it can be because of road traffic accident it can be because of industrial injury fall but very common i think the most common facial injury is the nasal bone and very important for us to understand uh, the 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 uh, diagnosis management of nasal bone because if these fractures are not adequately uh, recognized they are not adequately diagnosed early and they are not treated early they invariably land up with uh, post traumatic defects which are very difficult or at least require extensive uh, uh, surgery to uh, restore the uh, nasal architecture so the edema can mask the underlying nasal deformity the crepitation instability uh, thus many physicians and patients fail to pursue further diagnosis and appropriate treatment it happens on a day uh, day to day it happened to me i don't know if it happened to others but it is quite common and if left untreated nasal fracture can result both in unfavorable appearance and in unfavorable function especially when underlying structure or integrity of bone or cartilage is lost so it is uh, 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 better to treat uh, initially early than wait for it to heal and then uh, struggle with the post uh, traumatic deformity so you can have uh, simple fractures uh, as you can see in this uh, uh, ct uh, or, or uh, the coronal section or the, you have complex fractures so simple fractures you can get away with the uh, you know, simple reduction and uh, maybe some immobilizing using, uh, using intranasal extra extranasal splints but complex fractures require open reduction so what are the indications for close reduction of the i call it nasoseptal because you know nasal bone fractures are always uh, associated with septal Uh, fractures and deformity so we call it nasal septal fractures uh, instead of calling nasal bone fracture so inferior invariably we also treat the septum while treating the nasal bone so what are the indications for close reduction of uh, uh, the nasal septal fractures displaced fractures with cosmetic deformity okay so fractures which have only cosmetic deformity fractures with resultant nasal obstruction and severely comminuted fractures where it's difficult to Uh, do an open reduction and uh, you know fix all the small multiple pieces of bone then it's is better to avoid an open reduction and do a, a quick and a, a good close reduction what are the indications for open reduction uh, of uh, uh, sorry indication of, what are the indications for open reduction severely displaced fractures not comminuted displaced fractures severe displacement of the nasal cartilage complex concomitant and extensive lacerations remaining deformity after close reduction so these are the indications for open reduction and contraindications of course csf rhinorrhea and fractures more than 4 uh, weeks old so these are uh, contraindications for uh, uh, open reduction of, uh, unless you plan to do a post traumatic uh, deformity correction later okay so just quickly let me go to show you these cases Okay, all these, I think, all of them are uh, post-traumatic uh, defects. You know? And so, this is a patient with malunited ma bilateral nasal bone fracture, which he he had uh, attained. Uh, I mean, had this accident uh, many years ago. But uh, second injury, recent injury, uh, uh, leading to nasal maxillary fracture with uh, deviated nasal septum. So, these are the kind of patients who who you cannot do just a close reduction. You will have to immediately do a. Uh, uh, And in a sense, you might have to osteotomize these uh, fractured segments before you uh, reduce uh, them using uh, your uh, ash or the wash and forceps. And invariably, these patients require septoplasty to correct the deviated nasal septum, which also corrects the deformity as well as corrects the 
uh, nasal patency. So their function is also correct. So you see, this is uh, the, uh, the fracture uh, or uh, the pattern which uh, he has now. Okay, so we had to do a uh, osteotomy of uh, the uh, nasal bones and then reduce it with uh, the vascular forceps, then do a septoplasm. Okay, and then of course, internal and external nasal splints. And then that is the post operative. You can see the correction of the nasal deviation. Uh, is also his, uh, the nasal uh, uh, passage is also well cleared and it seems to be breathing quite well. Okay, the post traumatic septal deviation again, post traumatic old case of trauma did a septoplasty to correct uh, deviated nose. Now, what do you do in such situations? This is a case of uh, a severe uh, uh, laceration to his uh, nose uh, with the complete loss of the uh, soft tissue architecture. Okay. This patient, uh, I, I just did uh, soft tissue closure and then uh, close reduction uh, of uh, the septum and, uh, and internal and external uh, stabilizing with internal splint and external splints. Now this patient, uh, if you see, he has uh, still a post-deformity defect. But he doesn't want that character because he'll come back later. So these are the kind of cases that I think we have to discuss and decide as to how to plan so that we don't require a second surgery. Now this patient, though he had a severe uh, injury and laceration in nose, he had fortunately, thank thankfully, no bone injury, he just required a, a correction and closure of his own, and then he was perfectly all right. Both his form and the function were restored. Now, this patient again, okay, he, he, uh, he had a severe uh, uh, injury uh, resulting in fracture of the frontal bone and the uh, nasal bone, and uh, uh, I had to uh, of course, fix his frontal bones and did a close reduction. I didn't do an open reduction and fixation of his uh, nasal bones. Uh, but uh, he seems to be, I, I told him we can probably do it at second stage, but he's quite happy to uh, be like this. He didn't want a little more extension of his suture line for fixing the nasal bones. Now, this is a, you know, a, a classical case of a pan facial trauma, you know, uh, of course, I'm not going to discuss uh, this patient because uh, uh, this is this is going to be uh, a treatment like how uh, Arun said it can uh, management of pan facial. He had all fractures, frontal bone, the, the nasoethmoid complex, nasal bone, the, the uh, maxilla, the mandible. Okay, that's how it was. So now this was a patient uh, whom I treated. I fixed his uh, zygomas. I fixed his maxilla. I fixed his uh, frontal bones, I treated his nasal bones. But when I came back to his nose, you know, it was so grossly committed, the, uh, the nasal bones, I was not able to fix uh, with screws in place. So I just did uh, close reduction and, uh, and uh, managed with some external splints. And that is the result now. But you know definitely that this is really suboptimal. You can see his nose are flared, his uh, nose. Uh, uh, doesn't seem to have restored his, uh, uh, restored his original form. So these kind of uh, patients, I think, uh, will benefit uh, with the uh, you know, use of more advanced techniques like navigation surgery. Thank you very much. If you have any doubts. Uh, yes, sir. sir, can I come question for the nose fractures? Sir? Yeah, yeah, please. You want me to? If it is an, yeah, if it is an isolated nose, uh, yeah. what type of anesthesia you want to use, sir? Can we be done under local anesthesia? Yeah, I mean, if, if it is going to be just a reduction and uh, stabilizing with uh, external or internal splints, I think local anesthesia should be sufficient. Yeah, sufficient. But if it's isolated nose, uh, we, what happens is, uh, you know, uh, we tend to do take them all into the, uh, uh, into the theater because it is uh, patient uh, compliance is very good, you know, when they're totally anesthetized. So that is the only advantage. But if, uh, if there's no option, if we have to do a local, we have to do a local. I've done few locally in my clinic setup. Thank you.
to be done in a data center because sometimes you may end up with bleeding. So it's data is always better. Right? Always better. Yeah, correct. Yes. And uh, what sort of anesthesia you use? Local, just infiltration oh. around the nose or you give any blocks? No, no, I think uh, bilateral infraorbital and then, okay, uh, yeah, infraorbital and then a little infiltration inside the nose, yeah. you know, yeah. Yes, it works very well. Septum, septum, yes. septum yes. yeah, yes. it works well. Because uh, the infiltration around the nose, sometimes it becomes like any matter. So we don't know the yeah. correct reduction. That is one of correct. the disadvantages in using a local yeah. reduction. Bilateral infraorbital, I think, is uh, yeah, that good nice. with, uh, with uh, septal infiltration. And for the, uh, how long you uh, have the splint in place, sir? splint and the nasal packing? Nasal packing is for uh, 48 hours. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, splint, we leave it for 7 to 10 days, you know, some even 15 days. Sometimes what I do is I remove and make a new splint because as, as the edema subsides, okay. the splint becomes loose. So, you know, we tend to uh, make a new splint. Yes, sir. We now do this, actually removal splint, that uh, ready-made splint, aluminum uh, nasal splint is available. Correct, that correct. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you know, now uh, we are trying to do this uh, CAD CAM nasal splints. Oh, okay. So, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I know. Krishna yeah. Maharaja. Yes. Prabhu here. Ah, sir, 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 sir. Sir, no, no, sir. Sir, sir. Sir, sir. You were talking about the local anesthesia for the nasal practice. Yes, but we we'll have to be very, very careful because suddenly, sometimes the nasal practice bleeds heavily. Ah, that's what Arun was telling. That's why if we do it under uh, in the o OT setup, it's still yeah, easy. Correct. You know, even, you can put a post even if you are doing pack. it under under a sedation, uh, probably we are likely to push in an, an aspiration to the lungs. So it's better to be done under a GA. intubation than a GA. That's what I'm GA. saying. Intubated. No, I also totally agree, sir. But uh, since Arun asked, you know, there is very... No, no, that does not give a bad thing to the postgraduates. <laughs> that they will go do it under local. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely local in the sense, uh, uh, at least in the OT setup you can do, but not... Yeah, yeah. 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 Prepared for uh, anesthesia. Prepared, prepared to somebody, some anesthetist yes, should be nearby. Yeah, yeah. 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 should not yeah. tube yes. if it bleeds. Yeah. Correct. Even if it is local anesthesia, better be with the anesthetist, not us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. And do you use marrow seal or uh, like uh, what pack you use for nasal? Yeah, marrow seal. Marrow seal. I mean, if it's if there's a lot of bleeding, you use marrow seal. Okay. Otherwise, we just use uh, you know gauze. Uh, in Vaseline gauze. Vaseline gauze. Yeah, works uh, yeah, very well. We, we use that uh, sofratil. Sofratil. Yeah. We cut yeah. into a long thing, and that is the one. Yeah. yeah. We... Sofratil or uh, uh, b b b gauze, uh, roll of gauze. Uh, you know, we use uh, we... Vaseline. Yeah. Vaseline, you know, sometimes I uh, coat it with uh, some ointment, you know. Oh. Or in, Always uh, better to use the pack than the marathil because marathil doesn't give a good stabilization. Yes, sir. They only no, arrest sir. the bleeding. Uh, yeah, pack is good. always better. Um, if it bleeds, and in, uh, as you said, sir, under local anesthesia, if you're doing if it's severe bleeding, then you can use marathil. Yeah. 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 Uh, since Prabhu sir is there, I would like to ask him. Uh, Come here. I have seen sir's presentation years back where he was insisting on the use of Foley's catheter and all for comminuted zygoma fractures to keep them pla in place. Sir, do you use yeah, it even now or you prefer some other method? Yeah, yeah. There is a extensive bleeding immediate. It's the first aid that we do with person and Foley's catheter inside the nose and then put a, I mean, they inflate the bulb. The bleeding yes. stops. Yes. Then you take him to the theater, then cauterize or whatever, do whatever it is and then reduce the fracture. Then that is still an orbital use. floor. Sir uses that. It was about 10 no, years that back. Is, that is for the zygomatic and the yeah. uh, crumbled where, when there was no plates and there was no open reductions. We used to do that police catheter inflation into the antrum. Antrum. And bring it here. Yeah, bring yeah. antral yeah. ballooning. And then bring it to the position. The, I mean, the, the, the zygomatic bone and the anterior wall of maxilla, floor of the I mean, orbit can be inflated up. I'm sorry, it can be elevated up. Okay, sir. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, sir. I just want to, I just want to tell you, sir, this was the patient uh, who had, uh, who Arun, uh, Emmanuel, you were asking me about blindness, no? Yes. Sir. This this patient, his left eye, is, he's blind, okay. you know? Sir, they blind. wanted to know, uh, like, uh, this case, what was the sequence in which you fixed this case? One question, they've asked, what was the sequence used for this case? This, this was, this was, uh, this was, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think it was about two years back. I think bottom up, bottom up and outside in. Okay. Yeah. 
and uh, the the big difficulty i had in this patient was uh, i i believe uh, you know intraoperative i was not able to bring the teeth into a class 1 occlusion and then i had to send uh, my you know one uh, one staff from the theater to go outside and ask for his uh, photographs you know i made that mistake of not looking into his uh, pre morbid uh, photograph and then i realized that he was a case of a class 3 mandible okay okay <laughs> yeah class 3 mandible i mean i was uh, shocked to see that and of course i could not see his teeth but uh, from me fortunately he had a picture which was uh, very clear that it was class 3 and i asked uh, the 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 his sister or wife he said yes sir kilo pallu velle irko he said so i mean thank god i had that history otherwise i would have really tried to you know uh, uh, i was at one point uh, even thinking if i should do a bilateral surgery and push his mandible branch to bring his uh, uh, teeth into occlusion okay that and should be a trauma correction along with orthognathic or Orth- yeah but if if Orth- you have to achieve see the problem is these patients will not come back for surgery again see if you see his uh, second picture he's got anophthalmos okay and i did i did a, a floor uh, uh, reconstruction i did a uh, strike a plate and did a reconstruction you just see that little scar there is not healed completely okay uh, Next, now that is said orthognathic surgery i remember a case where we had a case with the maxillary fold fracture he was under treatment for braces for his proclined teeth right so yeah. your maxilla was impacted so i fixed it at the place i i i forgot about this yeah. otherwise i would have uh, looked into my pictures and then got it so he had a accidental leopard one osteotomy done so all i have to do is fix it in a impacted position so that is proclination of uh, teeth is also gone so um, what are the intubation options for mid face fractures when when do you choose what kind of intubation you want So yeah, it has to be either tracheostomy or submental. There is no other choice. Okay, you don't mind giving a scar of a sub uh, submental um, that is just a nick, half a centimeter nick down below the cheek, chin. Uh, because if you want to have a nasal intubation, right, you do all the works, then you have to shift that into an oral intubation, and then do the nose. That's going to be very clumsy. So uh, you cannot, you don't have a choice there. You have to be either with tracheostomy or a submental intubation. That is mandatory. no submental i think is uh, quite acceptable in fact uh, uh, in all my orthognathic cases where i do a lefort impaction i don't do a nasal intubation i do a submental okay. because i know i know what's happening to the nose i can i, yes. I can control the width of the nose you know in Very fact uh, what we did uh, in uh, uh, jimson's uh, uh, college uh, i think uh, a couple of months few months back Uh, lefort one with uh, amo subapical genioplasty we did a submental because it's very difficult to uh, you know monitor the nose uh, with a tube in the nose and especially of course for uh, lefort two lefort three you can't afford to uh, put a tube through the nose because you know risks or uh, risks involved in uh, nasal intubation no? i'd yeah. like to two things one point it is not possible uh, for the nasal bone is fractured it is yeah. not possible it's dangerous other one you have to fix the nasal bone also nasal you cannot do a thing which yeah. with a tube inside the nose can i in, can i interfere yeah yes, yes sir it's a big thing is what there are few anesthetists we are very worried about giving the submental they don't want won't ask for me for the neck so in that such cases what that uh, we do it we put put the I mean, uh, trans nasal naso tracheal Finish of the maxilla mandible part. Ah, that's one more option. Then you have to shift to the oral. That's what I say. You have to shift it again. That is going to be yeah. very clumsy, sir, because we are fixing a lot of fractures, which is it's going to be very clumsy. This that's is a very more... simple procedure. Most of the anesthetists won't know. We have to do it, sir. We have to learn this. We can guide them. We have to tell them in prior. And this is five minutes of any. Yeah. They are, they are willing can... to do a tracheostomy, but they don't want the submental. No, 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 no. no, no, no. This is a, that is a misconception. I think it's a. <laughs> Just no, a mind sub- block, sir. I think this is that should be very simple. So submental, submental. I started way back in 1993, sir. I think I was the first one in no, Chennai no, no, to do. It's a simple so procedure. So they don't want us to poke the yeah. neck. Something happened. That's why you have killed them. Yeah. <laughs> Probably they won't be able to do that. Sir, because we have to help them out, sir. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Sir, uh, convince them. Uh, one last question. I, I can't think of anything other than submental intubation for mid-face practice, sir. Yeah. Manuel, I'd like to add a point. When we start. Uh, operate these uh, multiple facial fractures especially which involves the mid face and the mandible and all uh, 
uh, quite often in the initial stages if you see we'll open up and strike and struggle and spend more time in aligning these bone fragments if we can get a reasonable occlusion uh, right away most of the bones will fall into place and then we can proceed from there is it true, true yeah yeah that is true but the next in this case for example uh, his uh, maxilla was so badly shattered that's he, he had he had uh, multiple dento elder fractures yeah. he had a mid palatal split okay so it is and, and he was the with a mandibular uh, prognathism case so can you imagine the yeah it, it took me almost one hour to figure out how to put his occlusion together yeah correct, so correct. what happens is in the process this i had done a submental for him in the process you tend to neglect the nose part you know and then you see his nose is wide i don't know uh, i mean the patient is very happy with this result okay yeah. i'm not i'm not 100% happy i think could have been better i mean any view sir prabhu sir what do you think what to a augmentation of the i mean the nasal no no that, that is true subsequently we, yeah subsequently this will be a subsequent second correction you can correct it hmm. augmentation no. but the yeah any other view of the Sarun? nasal base so we do uh, lr cinching for even all these procedures even trauma trauma i have not done I no, see, nose, nose cannot yeah. be primary. Yeah. Most of the nose needs secondary plaster, yeah. particularly of nose. these cases. Like the most extent. of the nose, yeah. The widening can be to an extent, like you know, you consider it like whatever you do for an orthognathic surgery. Emmanuel, you have to come close to the mic. You are not audible. Yeah, like uh, uh, routinely, as we do for an orthognathic surgery, even these yeah. cases would benefit to a little extent from. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's to, a, to a great extent. Yes, I mean, basically, the True. principle remains the same, isn't it? Yes. Just Sir, that. one last question. It's about uh, like you know, uh, do you advise coronoidectomy for a malunited arch? Co coronoid, yeah. yeah coron you always yeah. go in and refract. No, no. If, and if 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 uh, if there is no cosmetic deformity because of the zygomatic arch fracture, okay, and the only uh, uh, only indication is uh, mouth, opening. mouth yeah. opening function. I think it's a very very simple procedure, very very effective. and can be done in a local anesthesia yeah prabhu sir we should not say no but it's a very simple yeah no no <laughs> because there are bleeding there that i said that correct correct uh, it's a very simple and very very effective only thing is no, even know, in this case if there if you are bringing back the fragments of the arch into its position you don't need to do a coronoidectomy correct there no, is no, nothing wrong in doing a coronoidectomy to increase the mouth open yeah but there if, may be a scarring there what the man was asking is suppose is arch with impingement can you yeah, get you away with it better best better to do to do oh, a sir, it's all united it's healed totally yeah, yeah. no But then what? you then you can just do a coronary what simple procedure But, you but uh, there is no cosmetic deformity involved you can get away just mouth opening it's yeah. around the ear you can do a coronary but uh, you will have to advocate extensive uh, physiotherapy no? otherwise uh, you can go back to difficulty there is there a role for palatal splints in in uh, mid palatal splits and things like that does it make it easier yeah particularly uh, with the three dimensional uh, uh, serial development model it yeah. does work well it does uh, that helps it works well uh, but uh, but uh, i mean uh, in my ex experience what uh, we can actually get away is uh, Uh, use these wires, you know, trans arch wires, trans arch wires, trans -arch trans -arch wires. wires. Okay. Okay. and then yeah, and then put your arch bar on upper lower trans arch wires, and as you are uh, tightening, you get it to occlusion. Okay. Or you can also do trans arch uh, screws. You can put the small screws, and then put a wire right. across them, and then tighten them. And then tighten it. Yes. Yeah. I But use a long plate across the prime bone rim. So Would you want trans palatal yeah. plating, sir? transparent yeah, plating also yeah yes yeah. you can do but reduction is the problem reduction problem but uh, no, no, but to... why why unnecessarily you know uh, raise again yeah, raise the flap yeah, because you have so much to do you know these patients so no it is not that easy to put a transparent plate yeah. Yeah. Yes. you can even put it over the mucosa and later yeah. on yeah. Yeah. or you can put across the the uh, anterior maxilla no, i said that ah, trans anterior is wiring the... is the best wiring is the best yeah. yes. splint also helps in disinfections you can use the splint yeah. and then disinfect so that no splint is also used for the will be intact ah. yeah correct yeah. any other questions i have uh, three more cases yeah. okay.
Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Arun. Uh, you have to you have to take on the screen, sir. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Uh, this is a case of we have seen a lot of uh, dentulous cases. This is one particular case, which is an edentulous maxilla. Yeah. This is this case. Uh, completely crushed maxilla. See the maxilla, absolutely nothing is here. And see the face, it's totally uh, crushed over here. Look at the prognathic mandible, nothing is over here. This guy has got both uh, breathing issue as well because of the crushed nose and other things. Uh, how to go about this case? Any suggestions from the panelist or moderators? I mean, uh, yeah, the the prime. Is, is this since, a fresh case? Yes, sir. Since there is no there is no teeth, so uh, and uh, the uh, the fracture has uh, uh, caused. Uh, what's the cause for difficulty in breathing? Nose. Every bone is crumbled over there, sir. Oh, the nose is okay. Yeah, fully shattered, crumbled. Okay. He has got a nasal bone fracture. I mean, crushed, crumbled. Completely, the mid face is crumbled. There is no, there is no soft tissue injury on his face. No, not much, sir. No, and nothing to act, nothing to access his nose or the face. Yeah, yeah, there is a scarring. There is a laceration over the nose. This is a fresh case, new case. New case, yeah. Okay. So, so what we did was we just... fabricated. We took impressions huh. and uh, arbitrarily put the maxilla forward. Uh, because there is no teeth, and then fabricated a gunning type of flint with some wires and also some drill holes and screws. Then on the table, this is back at the mandible, axilla. I mean, crush. It was it was not easy. Uh, we just uh, tried and then manipulated, and we were able to achieve this amount of uh, bringing it forward. And then put some screws into the maxilla, and put some screws and fix it to the mandible as well. This gap was uh, created for him to feed, and in addition, because the maxilla is shattered, this fixing of screws is not possible. So we had some circumzygomatic wiring also. He had a infraorbital fracture also. This part, lateral part of the zygoma, everything was intact. You see the CT. So we did this plate over here also, and lastly, we did this nasal bone fracture also. We reduced this nasal bone using ash forceps. This is your Walsham forceps, and then this is the projection we got. And this is him finally. After a month or so, he is able to breathe. His nose, everything uh, came back perfectly well. This was quite interesting because um, the way it looked in the city was almost shattering. So that is what uh, we did for this case. Any comments or any questions on this case? Yeah, yeah, quite interesting. Now the same same patient. If uh, if we had to see him. Uh, after a few months or a year, uh, do you think uh, a distraction would have helped? No way, sir. <laughs> we have to do an osteotomy. Yeah, yeah, yeah osteotomy and di distraction. Yes, yes. Case. Oh, distraction, yeah. No. Yes, yeah. sir. We have to do a distraction. Distraction, yeah. Okay. Good, good result. Very good, yeah. yeah. And some of the other cases, uh, particularly uh, like nasoethmoid complex, where they do have a head injury and they will report late to us or in time, sometimes they may uh, have come early, but because of non-availability of a neurosurgeon or reluctance of neurosurgeons to correct the frontal bone, right? We may end up, we cannot uh, straight away go and fix up the frontal bone without a neurosurgeon. At, at least I don't do that. At least I should have them by my side. I don't interfere into big frontal bone sutures, I mean fractures. So they may turn up to be do a secondary reconstruction. This is one particular case where had a severe injury in this nasomaxillary complex because of depressed frontal bone, depressed uh, nose, everything. Uh, these need grafting. We cannot just reduce, reduce these fractures normally. These need fractures. We harvested rib for him. So, and the refractures these frontal bones and then put some plates and then nose were re reconstructed with the rib. So this is how it is. This is one of the secondary deformity cases of the uh, nasomaxillary complex. Another similar case, which turned up quite late. So almost the same procedure. 
uh, we had harvested a rib again for him for this nose strut and also uh, this frontal bone was elevated a little bit, refractured, elevated and then fixed. Or I think we used the mesh also for this patient with the nasal strut. And uh, from here, he looks like this. Similar later reported case, fan facial fracture, severe depressed frontal bone here. Uh, we were able to do a mandible in the initial phase. Later on again with the deformity, he came again. Then we did a rib graft as well as a carial, calvarial graft. Uh, calvarial graft was used to reconstruct this frontal part of bone and also the floor where your rib was used to reconstruct the lateral orbital rib because the lateral orbital rib was completely missing and shattered. So we did use this lateral orbital rib for the lateral orbital rib. And then we harvested parietal bone for its uh, <coughs> frontal depression and also the floor of the orbit. And to an extent from where he is, we got this result. Totally sunken eyeball. And it has, uh, we have brought it up a little bit, not a complete perfect result, or at least to an extent, but he was very happy. Sometimes we do get some complex cases like this. Uh, primary repair, completely shattered with loss of loss, soft tissue as well. And all around, we have to fix up all around, open up all around. So we did with larger plates, bigger plates. And this is what we got. And this is the post-op result we got. And sometimes we call it as a thankless job. It is really literally thankless. Patient don't appreciate, even people don't appreciate like this COVID times. So we have to put up with these things and then strive hard. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for these questions? Yes. Uh, I think. Uh... Any questions for secondary deformities? No, they just wanted to know whether uh, all your cranial grafts you are assisted with a uh, neurosurgeon by your side. Pardon? For all your cranial grafts. Yeah. Is there a neurosurgeon by your uh, side? Uh, actually, I was in plastic, uh, but I ended up doing. But uh, I I feel that it is better to have a, a medically qualified person when doing because we are better off doing all this graft because we do it more often. So I was fortunate enough to be I was in the plastic department then. So I do harvest the cranial graft as well as rib graft everything. Uh, but they'll be on the side. They'll be on the paper of sites. But it's yeah. better to have other <laughs> surgery specialties uh, uh, to have these kind of people. That's why I said it's a part of you have to be a part of the team. Okay. You cannot do, go on do it alone. Uh, I don't think it was right on our part to go do all these things alone. Calvarium, uh, calvarial grafts, uh, you think uh, you will still need a neurosurgeon next year? Varun? Yes, sir. Cal for harvesting calvarial grafts, yes, you, do you think uh, we uh, definitely need a neurosurgeon around? Uh, we don't actually, we don't want to enter into the brain. Uh, okay. But I don't know, sir. Legally speaking, uh, some medically qualified person, uh, I personally feel uh, always better to have at least on the uh, name list. That is my based? personal uh, thing, sir. Oh, it depends on whether the surgeon is competent enough. Some people are... No, that is what... See, there is two questions. Uh, there is two questions. Like, I, I, I am so confident that I can have a secalvarial, iliac, ah. and uh, rib graph, whatever it is. But it is not about the competency alone. It's about legality also. Uh, but that doesn't arise when you have a neuro or other surgeons, right? They are legally qualified, whether they are competent enough or not. But they are legally qualified and are legally uh, stable, I think. That is what I always feel. So always have to use, have them around if I am mentioning in other areas. That is my personal opinion and thing. You are not questioned if there is no uh, speciality around. But when you have, you need to make the best use of them as well. Mm. Right? Like in the sense yeah, that's what. It's always safe have to have uh, safe and safe. Right? If something goes wrong, then uh, hell will break loose. Lassie. You will end up answering everything. No, no, I understand. I also agree. It is but, just uh, like we taking iliac bone grafts, no? No, we do everything. We do iliac, we do... Yeah, yeah we do. Oh, nothing is wrong. We do rib and then, uh, you know... We do, sir. We do, sir. No, actually, nowadays, we, we are our... better capable of doing all these things, actually. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. No, no, it's good to have uh, someone around, yes. at least for yes, legal sir. reasons. That is what I am saying, sir. So, I understand, yeah. And, sir, we had a wonderful two hours of deliberation. And... Uh, uh, thank you, uh, KK sir and uh, Arun, for the wonderful presentations. Over to Dr. Jimson. Thanks, thank Manuel. You. Thanks, Jinex.
thank you sir thank you so much thanks thanks sir arun and emmanuel pleasure to be with you thank you thank you uh, i have an announcement for the participants there is a google form link that i'm going to post in the chat box so you'll have five minutes uh, time to answer those questions and because uh, we'll be giving away certificates the certificates will be mailed to the participants whoever is filling in those details uh, from the uh, google form so just give me a minute i will we have to fill in the google form sir no not the participants sir the participants for the certification for the participants oh, not for us no no yeah, yeah. <laughs> our presence is visually confirmed yeah if you give me a participation by the college will give me salary this month <laughs> surely when there is a talk we have this stage here and crowd here now i had a peculiar fear i am all alone in a room this fear was more than the <laughs> and talking to a screen and yeah, dinesh direct was having a biscuit and having a cup of coffee also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. just like the usual conference when you have a tea time you have tea yeah like luckily, lunch time, you? luckily yeah. you didn't have biryani or lunch sunday right lunch time <laughs> are, are the participants listening to us now yes yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. okay you are like i think arun was going to talk about his spouse fears because he was at home <laughs> <laughs> No, I think we should uh, do a state conference uh, like this, you know, <laughs> online. Yeah. Yeah, Jameson will be on it already. Next state conference <laughs> online. So, next year, next year we will do. So we, there'll be no expense involved. <laughs> <laughs> no expenses for anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be missing my role, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll give you the job. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. K. K. Thank you, Dr. Arun. Thanks, It's a wonderful sir. presentation. Thank you, thank you, Reena, for uh, the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel and Dr. Dinesh. I'm very yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Jamson. Can we leave? Yes. And thanks to the striker. Yeah. yeah thanks to striker for their uh, cooperation. I don't know. Striker must be angry with me. I've been talking about suspension wires. <laughs> <laughs> I compensated for them, so don't. Worry. <laughs> you could have added the pediatric with face or not? I had I had a case of pediatric with face. No, no, that's what I mean. Because when you are talking about the suspension wires, it is mostly useful in the pediatric with uh, faces. Yeah, I did. I did put a case sir, for pediatric. I, probably I missed it. Yeah, I did put a case. Sir. You want to show it again, sir? That is a case. I am a fellow. You did. For that yes, sir. I am uh, with the sagmatic uh, suspension. Uh, Circum sagmatic, yeah. Yeah. When did you opt for a mesh, sir? Okay, okay, sir. Hello. Oh, what is that? What When will you opt for a uh, titanium mesh? For 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 floor. 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 Yes, sir. Floor. No, no. It was when you are when you are only. Uh, Uh, treating a zygomatic uh, complex, invariably the floor is not uh, drastically displaced. So I mean, uh, there is no disruption requiring. But if there is, then uh, uh, again depends on uh, orbital fractures, you know, all the all the symptoms, you know, uh, form and uh, functional deformity of the orbital floor fracture. Then you have to put a uh, reconstruct with a uh, orbital uh, floor mesh. I you would, form, would prefer yeah. a mesh, or uh, if it is small enough, a bone graft or a membrane or something like that. Or no, always... no, I always uh, put a mesh. Either, either one of those preform meshes, or uh, you know, fabricate, uh, uh, cut a mesh and then put. Because orbital floor, other orbital yeah. floor. Because bone grafts they tend to resorb over a period of time. So, But uh, yeah, you don't need a permanent graft because of the fibrosis. This will take over. Now they have this resorbable uh, sort of plate also. Because there is no need for a permanent structure. Uh, That's so true. Yeah. yeah okay, If you have I resorbable, plate, but is okay, it? Okay, I use cartilage. Sir. Ear cartilage okay. that works Ear well cut. for smaller defects. Yeah. That's okay for small defects, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, small Ear defects. Plate. Yeah. And Arun, so, one more yeah. question was: Why did you take a rib graft as well as a calvarial graft? Uh, 
that is what, what see the there was total uh, orbital rim was shattered like the lateral orbital rim was totally missing for that patient so we had to go in for two grafts and floor was missing and uh, some part of frontal that uh, that part of bone was also missing so we had to take a parietal graft for those things for cosmetic reasons and we need a rim also rim is better suited with sort of rim rather than a calvarial bone graft so i had to do both for that patient so when you want still the result is not good despite yeah. doing all these things the result is not all that perfect so when you want flat surfaces it's better to go for the rib and when you want curved surfaces like the floor no I if you want the strut nasal strut rib is the best thing you cannot have a calvarial graft and uh, orbital mostly we do it with uh, unless this was a peculiar case where the rim was totally shattered or the rim was absent in fact so that is why i went for the rib for this case particular case otherwise rib mostly we ship only for the nasal strut dorsum of the nose uh, unless you put a rib that won't give a projections we did use some implants also mm-hmm. metfold um, there is a lot of chance of 